Section 27 of The Glories of Ireland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Glories of Ireland, edited by Joseph Dunn and P.J. Lennox. Section 27, Irish Language and Letters, by Douglas Hyde, LLD, M.R.I.A. The Celtic languages consist of two divisions, A, the Gaelic, or Irish division, and B, the Kimric, or Welsh division. Between them they comprise A, Irish, Scotch Gaelic, and Manx, and B, Welsh, Armorican, and Cornish. All these languages are still alive, except Cornish, which died out about a hundred years ago. Of all these languages, Irish is the best preserved, and it is possible to follow its written literature back into the past for some thirteen hundred years, while much of the most interesting matter has come down to us from pagan times. It has left behind it the longest, the most luminous, and the most consecutive literary track of any of the vernacular languages of Europe except Greek alone. For centuries, the Irish and their language were regarded by the English as something strange and foreign to Europe. It was not recognized that they had any relationship with the Greeks or Romans, the French, the Germans, or the English. The once well-known statesman, Lord Lyndhurst, in the British Parliament, denounced the Irish as aliens in religion, in blood, and in language. Bop, in his great comparative grammar, refused them recognition as Indo-Europeans, and Potts, in 1856, also denied their European connection. It was left for the great Bavarian scholar, John Caspar Zeus, to prove to the world in his epoch-making Grammatica Celtica, published in Latin in 1853, that the Celts were really Indo-Europeans, and that their language was of the highest possible value and interest. From that day to the present, it is safe to say that the value set upon the Irish language and literature has been steadily growing amongst the scholars of the world, and that in the domain of philology, Old Irish now ranks close to Sanskrit for its truly marvellous and complicated scheme of word forms and inflections, and its whole verbal system. The exact place which the Celtic languages, of which Irish is philologically far the most important, hold in the Indo-European group has often been discussed. It is now generally agreed upon that, although both the Celtic and Teutonic languages may claim a certain kinship with each other, as being both of them Indo-European, still the Celtic is more nearly related to the Greek and the Latin groups, especially to the Latin. All the Indo-European languages are more or less related to one another. We Irish must acknowledge a relationship, or rather a very distant connecting tie, with English. But to trace this home, Irish must be followed back to the very oldest form of its words, and English must be followed back to Anglo-Saxon, and, when possible, to Gothic. The hard mutes, p, t, k, of Celtic, and for that matter of Sanskrit, Zend, Greek, Latin, Slavonic, and Lithuanian, will be represented in Gothic by the corresponding soft mutes, b, d, g, and the soft mutes in Celtic by the corresponding hard mutes in Gothic. Thus we find the Irish Dia, god, in the Anglo-Saxon Tiw, the god of war, whose name is perpetuated for all time in Tuisdag, now Tuesday, and we find the Irish Death in the Anglo-Saxon Toth, now Tooth, and so on. But of all the Indo-European languages, Old Irish possesses by far the nearest affinity to Latin, and this is shown in a great many ways, not in the vocabulary merely, but in the grammar, which for philologists is of far more importance, as, for example, the B future, the passive in R, the genitive singular and nominative plural of O stems, etc. Thus the Old Irish for man, nominative fer, genitive fir, dative fir, Accusative fern, plural nominative fir, genitive fern, is derived from the older forms wiros, wiri, wiro, wiron, nominative plural, wiri, genitive plural, wiron, which everyone who knows Latin can see at a glance correspond very closely to the Latin inflections vir, viri, viro, virum, nominative plural viri, etc. So much for the language. When did this language begin to be used in literature? This question depends upon another, 
When did the Irish begin to have a knowledge of letters? When did they begin to commit their literature to writing? And whence did they borrow their knowledge of this art? The oldest alphabet used in Ireland, of which remains exist, appears to have been the Ogham, or Oam, which is found in numbers of stone inscriptions dating from about the third century of our era on. About three hundred such inscriptions have already been found, most of them in the southwest of Ireland, but some also in Scotland and Wales, and even in Devon and Cornwall. Wherever the Irish Gael planted a colony, he seems to have brought his Ogham writing with him. The Irishman who first invented the Ogham character was probably a pagan who obtained a knowledge of Roman letters. He brought back to Ireland his invention, or, as is more likely, invented it on Irish soil. Indeed, the fact that no certain trace of Ogham writing has been found upon the European continent indicates that the alphabet was invented in Ireland itself. An inscription at Killeen Cormac, County Kildare, survives, which seems to show that the Roman alphabet was known in Ireland in pagan times. Ogham is an alphabet suitable enough for chiseling upon stones, but too cumbrous for the purposes of literature. For this, the Roman alphabet must have been used. The Ogham script consists of a number of short lines, straight or slanting, and drawn either below, above, or through one long stem line. This stem line is generally the sharp angle between two faces or sides of a long, upright rectangular stone. Thus, four cuts to the right of the long line stand for S, to the left of it they mean C, passing through it, half on one side and half on the other, they mean Z. The device was rude, but it was applied with considerable skill, and it was undoubtedly framed with much ingenuity. The vowels, occurring most often, are also the easiest to cut, being scarcely more than notches on the edge of the stone. The inscription generally consists of the name of the dead warrior over whom the memorial was raised. It usually begins on the left corner of the stone facing the reader, and is to be read upwards, and is often continued down on the right-hand angular line as well. The language of the Ogham inscriptions is very ancient, and nearly the same forms occur as in what we know of Old Gaulish. The language, in fact, seems to have been an antique survival, even when it was first engraved in the 3rd or 4th century. The word forms are probably far older than those used in the spoken language of the time. This is a very important conclusion, and it must have a far-reaching bearing upon the history of the earliest epic literature because if forms of language, much more ancient than any that were then current, were employed on pillar stones in the 3rd or 4th century, it follows that this obsolescent language must have survived either in a written or a regularly recited form. This immediately raises the probability that the substance of Irish epic literature, which was written down on parchment in the 6th or 7th century, really dates from a period much more remote, and that all that is purely pagan in it was preserved for us in the same antique language as the Ogham inscriptions before it was translated into what we now call Old Irish. The following is the Ogham alphabet is preserved on some 300 ancient pillars and stones in the probably ninth century treatise in the Book of Ballymote and elsewhere. Each letter consists of one to five parallel strokes in increasing order as follows. Above the stem line, H, D, T, C, Q. Below the stem line, B, L, V, S, N. Diagonally across it, M, G, N, G, Z, R. Vertically across it in short notches, A, O, U, E, I. There are a great many allusions to this Ogham writing in the ancient epics, especially in those that are purely pagan in form and conception, and there can be no doubt that the knowledge of letters must have reached Ireland before the island became Christianized. With the introduction of Christianity and of Roman letters, the old Ogham inscriptions, which were no doubt looked upon as flavoring of paganism, quickly fell into disuse and disappeared, but some inscriptions, at least, are as late as the year 600 or even 800. In the thoroughly pagan poem, The Voyage of Bran, which such authorities as Tsima and Kunomaya both consider to have been committed to parchment in the 7th century, we find it stated that Bran wrote the 50 or 60 quatrains of the poem in Ogham. Cuchulain constantly used Ogham writing, which he cut upon wands and trees and standing stones, for Queen Maeve's army to read 
and these were always brought to his friend Fergus to decipher. Cormac, king of Cashel, in his glossary, tells us that the pagan Irish used to inscribe the wands they kept for measuring corpses and graves with Ogham characters, and that it was a source of horror to anyone even to take it in his hand. St. Patrick, in his confession, the authenticity of which no one doubts, describes how he dreamt that a man from Ireland came to him with innumerable letters. In Irish legend, Ogma, one of the Tuatha de Danann, who was skilled in dialects and poetry, seems to be credited with the invention of the Ogham alphabet, and he probably was the equivalent of the Gaulish god Ogmios, the god of eloquence, so interestingly described by Lucian. We may take it, then, that the Irish pagans knew sufficient letters to hand down to Irish Christians the substance of their pagan epics, sagas, and poems. We may take it for granted, also, that the greater Irish epics, purely pagan in character, utterly untouched in substance by that Christianity which so early conquered the country, really represent the thoughts, manners, feelings, and customs of pagan Ireland. The effect of this conclusion must be startling indeed to those who know the ancient world only through the medium of Greek and Roman literature. To the Greek and to his admiring master, the Roman, all outside races were simply barbarians, at once despised, misinterpreted, and misunderstood. We have no possible means of reconstructing the ancient world as it was lived by the ancestors of some of the leading races in Europe, the Gauls, Spaniards, Britons, and the people of all those countries which trace themselves back to a Celtic ancestry, because these races have left no literature or records behind them, and the Greeks and Romans, who tell us about them, saw everything through the false medium of their own prejudices. But now, since the discovery and publication of the Irish sagas and epics, the descendants of these great races no longer find it necessary to view their own past through the coloured and distorting glasses of the Greek or the Roman, since there has now opened for them, where they least expected to find it, a window through which they can look steadily at the life of their race, or of one of its leading offshoots, in one of its strongholds, and reconstruct for themselves with tolerable accuracy the life of their own ancestors." It is impossible to overrate the importance of this for the history of Europe, because neither Teutons nor Slavs have preserved pictures of their own heroic past dating from pagan times. It is only the Celts, and of these the Irish, who have handed down such pictures drawn with all the fond intimacy of romance, and descriptions which exhibit the life of Western Europeans at an even earlier culture stage in the evolution of humanity, than do the poems of Homer. This conclusion, to which a study of the literature invites us, falls in exactly with that arrived at from purely archaeological sources. Professor Ridgway of Cambridge University, working on archaeological lines, expresses himself as follows, quote, From this survey of the material remains of the Latin period found actually in Ireland, and from the striking correspondence between this culture and that depicted in the Tyne Bocugne, and from the circumstance that the race who are represented in the epic is possessing this form of culture, resemble in their physique the tall, fair-haired, grey-eyed Celts of Britain and the continent, we are justified in inferring, one, that there was an invasion or invasions of such peoples from Gaul in the centuries immediately before Christ, as is described by the Irish traditions, and two, that the poems themselves originally took shape when the Latin culture was still flourishing in Ireland. But as this could hardly have continued much later than A.D. 100, we may place the first shaping of the poems not much later than that date, and possibly a century earlier. End quote. This conclusion would make the earliest putting together of the Irish epics almost contemporaneous with Augustus Caesar. So much for the history and growth of Irish letters. References Brash, Ogham Inscribed Monuments of the Gael, 1879. McAllister, Studies in Irish Epigraphy, Volume 1, 1897, Volume 2, 1902, Volume 3, 1907. Rees, In Proceedings of the Scottish Society of Antiquaries, Edinburgh, 1892. Ridgeway, Date of the First Shaping of the Cuchulain Saga, 1905, In Proceedings of the British Academy, Volume 2. Joyce, Social History of Ancient Ireland, Volume 1, Chapter 2. Preface to facsimile edition of the Book of Ballymote. End of section 27. Recording by Owen Cook in Potawatomi Ceded Land.
Section 28 of The Glories of Ireland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Olson, Fytak, Los Angeles. The Glories of Ireland. Edited by Joseph Dunn and P. J. Lennox. Section 28. Native Irish Poetry by Professor Georges Dautin. Note. This chapter was written in French by M. Dautin, who is a distinguished professor and dean at the University of Renac, France. The translation into English has been made by the editors. By the year 1200 of the Christian era, a time at which the other national literatures of Europe were scarcely beginning to develop, Ireland possessed, and had possessed for several centuries, a Gaelic poetry, which was either the creation of the soul of the people, or else was the work of the courtly bards. This poetry was at first expressed in rhythmical verses, each containing a fixed number of accented syllables and hemisticks separated by a pause. Christlim, Christreum, Christ Indecat, Christ Indium, Christ Isum, Christ Uasum, Christ Desum, Christ Uasum. This versification, one of the elements of which was the repetition of words or sounds at regular intervals, was transformed about the eighth century into a more learned system. Thenceforward, alliteration, assonance, rhyme, and a fixed number of syllables constituted the characteristics of Irish verse. Misa ochus pangurabhan, hichtar nachar friasandan, bita men ma samfixerlich, mumen ma kein im sechthert. As we see, the consonants in the rhyme words were merely related. L, R, N, N, G, M, D, H, G, H, B H M H C H T H F could rhyme together just as could G G D D B B. Soon the poets did not limit themselves to end rhymes, which ran the risk of becoming monotonous, but introduced also internal rhyme, which set up what we may call a continuous chain of melody. Is eric haram dore, ara reda agone, sa homat a engel find, o shind go athorele. This harmonious versification was replaced in the seventeenth century by a system in which account was no longer taken of consonantal rhyme or of the number of syllables. The rules of Irish verse have nothing in common with classical Latin meters which were based on the combination of short and long syllables. In low Latin, indeed, we find occasionally alliteration, rhyme, and a fixed number of syllables, but these novelties are obviously of foreign origin and date from the time when the Romans borrowed them from the nations which they called barbarous. We cannot prove beyond yea or nay that they are of Celtic origin, but it is extremely probable that they are, for it is among the Celts both of Ireland and of Wales that the harmonizing of vowels and of consonants has been carried to the highest degree of perfection. This learned art was not acquired without long study. The training of a poet, Filet, lasted twelve years or more. The poets had a regular hierarchy. The highest in rank, the Olam, knew 350 kinds of verse and could recite 250 principal and 100 secondary stories. The Olams lived at the court of the kings and the nobles, who granted them freehold lands. Their persons and their property were sacred, and they had established in Ireland schools in which the people might learn history, poetry, and law. The bards formed a numerous class of a rank inferior to the filet. They did not enjoy the same honors and privileges. 
some of them even were slaves according to their standing different kinds of verse were assigned to them as a monopoly the danish invasions in the ninth century set back for some time the development of irish poetry but when the irish had driven the fierce and aggressive sea rovers from their country there was a literary renaissance this was in turn checked by the anglo-norman invasion in the twelfth century and thereafter the art of versification was no longer so refined as it had formerly been nevertheless the bardic schools still existed in the seventeenth century more than four hundred years after the landing of strongbow and in them students followed the lectures of the olams for six months each year or until the coming of spring exercising both their talents for composition and their memory a catalogue of irish poets which has recently been made out shows that there were more than a thousand of them we have lost many of the oldest poems but the irish scribes often modernized the texts which they were copying hence the language is not always a sufficient indication of date and it is possible that under a comparatively modern form some very ancient pieces may have been preserved even if the poems attributed to amergin do not go back to the tenth century b c as has been claimed for them they are in any case old enough to be archaic and certain poems of the mythological cycle are undoubtedly anterior to the christian era we have reason to believe that there have been preserved some genuine poems of finn macumal third century a hymn by saint patrick d four sixty one some greatly altered verses of saint columcille d five ninety seven and certain hymns written by saints who lived from the seventh to the ninth century the main object of the most celebrated of the ancient poets up to the end of the twelfth century was to render history genealogy toponymy and lives of saints readier of access and easier to retain by putting them into verse form and it is the names of those scholars that have been rescued from oblivion while lyric poetry having as its basis nothing more than sentiment has remained for the most part anonymous after the anglo-norman invasion the best poet seems to have been don cadach morodali d twelve forty four of later date were teg magdere fifteen seventy to sixteen fifty two teg dal o'higgin d sixteen fifteen and yokadech o'hasi who belonged to the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries the new school which abandoned the old rules and whose inspiration is now personal now patriotic is represented by kena keens or laments abran hymns or eislingi visions composed among others by geoffrey keating d c sixteen fifty david obrodar c sixteen twenty five to sixteen ninety eight egan o'reilly c sixteen seventy c seventeen thirty four john macdonnell sixteen ninety one to seventeen fifty four william o'heffernan f l seventeen fifty john o'tawmy seventeen o six to seventeen seventy five and andrew mcgrath d c seventeen ninety the greatest of the eighteenth century irish poets was owen roe o'sullivan c seventeen forty eight to seventeen eighty four whose songs were sung everywhere and who in the opinion of his editor father dinin is the literary glory of his country and deserves to be ranked among the few supreme lyric poets of all time if in order to study the subjects treated by the poets we lay aside didactic poetry and confine ourselves to the ancient poems from the seventh to the eleventh century 
we shall find in the latter a singular variety. They were at first dialogues or monologues, now found incorporated with the sagas of which they may have formed the original nucleus. Thus, in the voyage of Bran, we have the account of the Isles of the Blessed and the discourse of the King of the Sea. In the expedition of Loger Macrinachan, the brilliant description of the fairy hosts. In the death of the sons of Unsech, the touching farewell of Deirdre to the land of Scotland, and her lamentation over the dead bodies of the three warriors. And in the lay of Fothard Canaan, the strange and thrilling speech of the dead lover, returning after the battle to the tryst appointed by his sweetheart. Other poems seem never to have figured in a saga, like the song of Crede, daughter of Goere, in which she extols the memory of her friend Dinartach and the affecting love scenes between Liaden and Kurtir, or like the bardic songs designed to distribute praise or blame. The funeral panegyric on King Nial in alternate verses, the song of the sword of Carol, and the satire of Macongline against the monks of Cork. Religious poetry comprised lyric fragments, which were introduced into the lives of the saints, and there formed a kind of Christian saga, or else were based on holy writ, like the Lamentation of Eve, hymns in honor of the saints, like the hymn to St. Michael by Mael Isu, pieces such as the famous hymn of St. Patrick, and philosophic poems like that keen analysis of the flight of thought which dates from the tenth century. At a time when the poets of other lands seem wholly engrossed in the recital of the deeds of men, one of the great and constant distinguishing marks of poetry in Ireland, whether we have to do with a short note set down by a scribe on the margin of a manuscript, or with a religious or profane poem, is a deep, personal and intimate love of nature expressed not by detailed description, but more often by a single picturesque and telling epithet. Thus we have the hermit, who prays God to give him a hut in a lonely place beside a clear spring in the wood, with a little lark to sing overhead. Or we have Marban, who, rich in nuts, crab-apples, sloes, watercress, and honey, refuses to go back to the court to which the king, his brother, presses him to return. Now we have the description of the summer scene, in which the blackbird sings and the sun smiles. Now the song of the sea and of the wind, which blows tempestuously from the four quarters of the sky. Again the winter song, when the snow covers the hills, when every furrow is a streamlet, and the wolves range restlessly abroad, while the birds, numbed to the heart, are silent. Or yet again the recluse in his cell, humorously comparing his quest of ideas to the pursuit of the mice by his pet cat. This deep love of inanimate and animate things becomes individualized in those poems in which every tree, every spring, every bird is described with its own special features. If we remember that these original poems, which, before the twelfth century, expressed thoughts that were scarcely known to the literature of Europe before the eighteenth, are besides clothed in the rich garb of a subtle harmony, what admiration, what respect, and what love ought we not to show to that ancient Ireland which, in the darkest ages of Western civilization, not only became the depositary of Latin knowledge and spread it over the continent, but also had been able to create for herself new artistic and poetic forms. References Hyde, Love Songs of Connacht Dublin, 1893. Irish Poetry, an essay in Irish with translation in English and a vocabulary. Dublin, 1902. The Religious Songs of Connacht, London, 1906. Meyer, Ancient Gaelic Poetry, 
Glasgow, 1906. A primer of Irish metrics with a glossary and an appendix containing an alphabetical list of the poets of Ireland. Dublin, 1909. Dotin Dunn, The Gaelic Literature of Ireland. Washington, 1906. Meyer, Selections from Ancient Irish Poetry, 2nd Edition, London, 1913. Best, Bibliography of Irish Philology and of Printed Irish Literature, Dublin, 1913. Loth, La Métrique Galoise, Paris, 1902. Thurnason, Mythalische Wesleren, Irische Text, 3. Bouille la Dublin, 1910. End of section 28. Recording by Linda Olson Fitak, Los Angeles. Section number 29 of The Glories of Ireland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Glories of Ireland, edited by Joseph Dunn and P.J. Lennox. Irish Heroic Sagas by Eleanor Hull. Ireland has the unique distinction of having preserved for mankind a full and vivid literary record of a period otherwise, so far as native memorials are concerned, clouded in obscurity. A few fragmentary suggestions derived from ancient stone monuments or from diggings in tumuli and graves are all that Gaul or Britain have to contribute to a knowledge of that important period just before and just after the beginning of our era, when the armies of Rome were overrunning Western Europe and were brought, for the first time, into direct contact with the Celtic peoples of the West. Almost all that we know of the early inhabitants of these countries comes to us from the pens of Roman writers and soldiers, Posidonius, Caesar, Diodorus, Tactus. We may give these observers credit for a desire to be fair to peoples they sometimes admired and often dreaded. But conquerors are not always the best judges of the races they are engaged in subduing, especially when they are ignorant of their language, unversed in their lore and customs, and unused to their ways. Valuable as are the reports of Roman authorities, we feel at every point the need of checking them by native records. But the native records of Gaul, and in large part also those of Britain and Wales, have been swept away. Caesar is probably right in saying that the Druids, who were the learned men of their race and day, committed nothing to writing. If they did, whatever they wrote has been irrevocably lost. But Ireland was exempt from the sweeping changes, brought about through long periods of Roman and Saxon occupation. No great upheaval from without disturbed the native political and social conditions up to the coming of the Norse and Danes, about the beginning of the ninth century. Agricola, standing on the western coast of Britain, looked across the dividing channel and reflected upon the beneficial connection that the conquest of Ireland would have formed between the most powerful parts of the Roman Empire. But fortunately for the literature of Ireland, if not for her history, he never came. The early incursions of the Scotty, or Irish, were eastward into England, Wales, and Gaul and there seemed to have been few return movements towards the West. Ireland pursued her path of native development undisturbed. It is to this circumstance that she owes the preservation of so much of her native literature. A great body of material, historical, religious, poetic, romantic, showing marks of having originated at a very early time, and a great variety and interest. At what period this literature first began to be written down, we do not know. Erosius tells us that a traveler named Athicus spent a considerable time in Ireland early in the 5th century, examining their volumes, which tends to prove that there was writing in Ireland before St. Patrick. But the native bard must have made writing superfluous. The man who could, at a moment's notice, recite any one out of the 350 stories which might be called for, besides poetry, genealogies, and travel records, was worth many books. Only a few were expert enough to read his writings, but all could enjoy his tales. The earliest written records that we have now existing date from the 7th or 8th century. But undoubtedly, there is preserved for us, in these materials, a picture of social conditions going back to the very beginning of our era. And Covell, 
with the straight stage of civilization known as archaeology as La Tena or Late Celtic. To help his memory, the early Shanishi or storyteller grouped his romantic stories door under different heads, such as Tains or cattle spoils, feasts, elopements, sieges, battles, destructions, tragical deaths. But it is easy for us now to group them in another way and to class together the series of tales referring to the Duitha de Dedanin, or ancient deities, those belonging to the Red Branch cycle of King Kokobar and Kutulain, those relating to Finn and the legends of the kings. The hundred or more tales belonging to the second group are especially valuable for social history on account of the detailed descriptions they give of customs, dress, weapons, habits of life, and ethical ideas. To the historian, folklorist, and student of primitive civilizations, they are documents of the highest importance. It seems likely that the Red Branch cycle of tales, including the epic tale of the Tain or cattle spoil of Kulenj, which has gathered round itself a number of minor tales, had some basis of historical fact, and arose in the period of Ulster's predominance to celebrate the deeds of a band of warlike champions who flourished in the north about the beginning of the Christian era. No one who has visited the rafts of the Aman Macha near Ma, where stood the traditional site of the ancient capital of Ulster, or has followed the well-defined and massive outworks of Rath, Kelcher, and the forts of the other heroes, whose deeds the tales embody, could doubt that they had their origin in great events that once happened there. The topography of the tales is absolutely correct. Or again, when we cross over into Kanat, the remains of Rath Cronin, near the ancient palace of the Amazonian queen, Med, testify to similar events. She it was who, in her pillow talk with her husband, Aliyah, declared that she had married him only because in him did she find the strange bride gift, which her imperious nature demanded, a man without stinginess, without jealousy, without fear. It was in her desire to surpass her husband in wealth that she sent the combined armies of the south and west into Ulster to carry off a famous bull, the Brown Bull of Cooley, the only match in Ireland for one possessed by her spouse. This raid forms the central subject of the Tain Bocoulanche. The motive of the tale and the kind of life described in it alike show the primitive conditions out of which it had rise. It belongs to a time when land was plenty for the scattered inhabitants to dwell upon but stock to place upon it was scarce. The possession of herds was necessary not only for food and the provisioning of troops, but as a standard of wealth, proof of position, and a means of exchange. Everything was estimated before the use of money, by its value in keen, or herds, when Med and Ale compare their possessions to find out which of them is better than the other, their herds of cattle, swine, and horses are driven in. Their ornaments and jewels, their garments and vats and household appliances are displayed. The pursuit of the cattle of neighboring tribes was the prime cause of the innumerable raids which made every man's life one of perpetual warfare, much more so than the acquisition of land or the avenging of wrongs. Hence a motive that may seem to us insufficient and remote as the subject of a great epic arose out of the necessities of actual life. Cattle driving is the oldest of all occupations in Ireland. The conditions we find described in these tales show us an open country, generally unenclosed by hedges or walls. The chariots can drive straight across the province. There are no towns, and the stopping places are the large farmers' dwellings, open inns known as houses of hospitality, fortified by surrounding rats or earthen walls. The only private property and land, in a time when the tribe land was common, that we hear of at this period. Within these borders lay the pleasure grounds and gardens of the cattle sheds for the herds, which the great landowners or chief loaned out to the smaller men in return for services rendered. Here were trained in the arts of industry and fine needlework, the daughters of the chief men of the tribe and their foster sisters, drawn from the humbler families around them. The rivers as a rule formed the boundaries of the provinces, and the fords were constantly guarded by champions who challenged every wayfarer to single combat if he could not show sufficient reason for crossing the borderland. These combats were fought actually in the fort itself, and all wars began in a long series of single hand-to-hand -hand combats between equal champions before the armies as a whole engaged each other. To fight was every man's prime duty. 
and the man who had slain the largest number of his fellows was acclaimed as the greatest hero. It was the proud boast of the Conal Kernanch, the victorious, that seldom had a day passed in which he had not challenged a Connaughtman, and a few nights in which a Connaughtman's head had not formed his pillow. It shows the primitive savagery of the period that skulls of enemies were worn dangling from the belt, and were stored up in one of the palaces of Iman Maka as trophies of valor. So warlike were the heroes that even during friendly feasts their weapons had to be hung up in a separate house, lest they should spring to arms in rivalry with their own fellows. Yet in spite of this rude barbarism of outward life, the warriors had formed for themselves a high and exacting code of honor which may be regarded as the first steps toward what in later times and other countries became known as chivalry, save that there is in the acts of Irish heroes a simplicity and sincerity which puts them on a higher level than the obligatory courtesies of more artificial ages. Generosity between enemies was carried to an extraordinary pitch, twice over in fights with different foes. Connell Kiernak binds his right hand to his side in order that his enemy, who had lost one hand, may fight on equal terms with him. The two severest combats sustained by Cuculin, the youthful Ulster champion, in the long war of the Thane, are those with Locke the Great and Ferdinand, both first-rate warriors, who had been forced by the wiles of Meb into unwilling conflict against their young antagonist. In their youth they had been fellow pupils in the school of the Amazon Sikatu, had taught them both alike the arts of war. When Locke the Great, as a dying request, prays Kulikang to permit him to rise, so that he may fall on his face and not backwards toward the men of Aaron, lest hereafter it should be said that he fell in flight, Kulikang replies, That will I will surely, for it is a warrior's boon thou cravest. And he steps back to allow the wounded man to reverse his position to the ford. The tale of Kulikang's combat with Ferdiad had become classic. Nothing more pathetic or more full of the true spirit of chivalry is to be found in any literature. Each warrior estimates nobly the prowess of the other. Each sorrowfully recalls the memory of his old friendships and expeditions made together. When Frigidid falls, his ancient comrade pours out over him a passionate lament. Each night, when the day's combat is over, they throw their arms round each other's neck and embrace. Their horses are put up in the same paddock, and their charioteurs sleep beside the same fire. Each night, Kulikane sends to his wounded friend a share of the herbs that are applied to his own wounds, while to Kulikane, Ferdiad sends a fair half of the pleasant, delicate food supplied to him by the man of Aaron. We may recall, too, Kulikane's act of compassion toward Queen Meb near the close of the Tain. Her army is flying en route homeward across the Shannon, closely pursued by Kulikane. As he approaches the ford, he finds Queen Medeba lying prostrate on the bank. Unable any longer to guard the retreat of her army, she appeals to her enemy to aid her. And Kulaklain, with that lovable boyish delight in acts of supreme generosity, which is always ascribed to him, undertakes to shield the retreat of the disordered host from his own troops and to see them safely across the river, while Medb reposes peacefully in a field hard by. The spirit which actuates the heroes is well expressed by Kulaklain when his friends would restrain him from going forth to his last fight, knowing that in that battle he must fall. I had rather than the whole world's gold, and then the earth's riches that death had ere now befallen me. So would not this shame and testimony of reproach now stand recorded against me, for in every tongue this noble old saying is remembered. Fame outlives life. The Irish tales surpass those of the Arthurian cycle in simplicity, in humor, and in human interest. The characters are not mere types of fixed virtues and vices. They have each a strongly marked individuality, consistently adhered to through the multitude of different stories in which they play a part. This is especially the case with regard to the female characters. Emmer, Deirdre, Etan, Grain may be said to have introduced into European literature new types of womanhood, quite unlike in their sprightliness and humor, their passionate affection and heroic qualities, to anything found elsewhere. Stories about women play a large part in ancient Irish literature. Their elopements, their marriages, their griefs, and tragedies form the subject of a large number of tales. 
among the list of tales that any bard might be called upon to recite the courtships or wooings probably formed a favorite group they are of great variety and beauty the irish indeed may be called the inventors of the love tale for modern europe the gravest effect of this literature a defect which is common to all early literature before coming under the chastening hand of the master is undoubtedly its tendency to extravagance though much depended upon the individual writer some being stylus some not and all were prone to frequent and, and grotesque exaggerations the lack of restraint and self-criticism is everywhere apparent the old irish writer seems incapable of judging how to shape his material with a view to presenting it in its best form thus we have the feeling even with regard to the tain beau challenge that what has come down to us is rather the rough-shaped material of an epic than a completed design the single stories and the groups of stories that have been handled and rehandled at different times but only occasionally as in the story of deirdre the sorrowful tale of the sons of usnick or in the later versions of the wooing of emmer or the book of Leinster version of the wooing of ferb do we feel that a competent artist has so formed his story the best possible value has been extracted from it yet in spite of their defects the old heroic sagas of ireland have in them a stimulating force and energy and an element of fine and healthy optimism which is strangely at variance with the popular conception of the melancholy of irish literature and which wherever they are known make them the fountainhead of a fresh creative inspiration this stimulating of the imagination is perhaps the best gift that a revived interest in the old native romance of ireland has to bestow references the originals of many of the tales of the kulachin cycle of romances will be found usually accompanied by english or german translations in the volumes of ursh Uresh, text review celtique sheetskrift fur celt phil Iru Irish Text Society, Volume 2, Atlantis, Proceed of the R. Irish Academy, Irish MSS Series, and Todd Lecture Series. English translations of the Tain de Boulange, Lou and UBL versions, Miss Winifred's Faraday, 1904. LL version with conflate readings. But by Joseph Dunn, 1914, of various stories, E. Hole, the Kuklang Saga in Irish Literature, 1898. A. H. Leahy, Heroic Romances of Ireland, 1905-6, The Courtship of Ferb, 1902. French translations in the Arbois de Joubainvise et Popie, Celtic, on Ireland. German translations in Thur Mason, Sagan au Dim, Alien, Ireland, 1901. Free rendering by S. O. Grady in the coming of the Kulikine, 1904, and in his History of Ireland, the Heroic Period, 1878. For full bibliography, see R. I. Best Bibliography of Irish Philology and Printed Literature, 1913, and Joseph Dunn's Tain Beau Coulange, pages 32 through 36, 1914. End of section 29. Recording by April 6090, California. United States of America. Section number 30 of the Glories of Ireland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Kavanagh, Antwerp. The Glories of Ireland, edited by Joseph Dunn and P.J. Lennox. Section number 30. Irish Precursors of Dante by Sidney Gunn, M.A. One of the supreme creations of the human mind is the Divine Comedy of Dante, and undoubtedly one of its chief sources is the literature of ancient Ireland. Dante himself was a native of Florence, Italy, and lived from 1265 to 1321. Like many great men, he incurred the hatred of his countrymen, and he spent, as a result, the last twenty years of his life in exile with a price on his head. He had been falsely accused of theft and treachery, and his indignation at the wrong thus done him, and at the evil conduct of his contemporaries led him to write his poem, in which he visits hell, purgatory, and paradise, and learns how God punishes bad actions, and how He rewards those who do His will. 
To the writing of his poem Dante brought all the learning of his time, all its science, and an art that has never been surpassed, perhaps never equalled. Of course, he did not know any Irish, but he knew Italian, and the then universal tongue of the learned, Latin, in both of which were tales of visits to the other world, and the greater part of these tales, as well as those most resembling Dante's work, in form and spirit, were Irish in origin. All peoples have traditions of persons visiting the realms of the dead. Homer tells of Odysseus going there, Virgil is the same of Aeneas, and the Oriental peoples, as well as the Germanic races, have similar tales. But no people have so many or such finished accounts of this sort as the ancient Irish. In pagan times in Ireland, one of the commonest adventures attributed to a hero was a visit to Tirna Mio, the land of the living, or Tirna Nog, the land of the young. And this supernatural world was reached in some cases by entering a fairy mound and going beneath the ground to it, and in others by sailing over the ocean. Of the literature of pagan Ireland, though much has come down to us, we have only a very small fraction of what once existed. And what we have has been transmitted and modified by persons of later times in different culture, who, both consciously and unconsciously, have changed it, so that it is very different from what it was in its original form. But the subject and the main outline still remain and we have many accounts of both voyages and underground journeys to the other world. The oldest voyage is, perhaps, that of Maldown, which Tennyson has transmuted into English under the title The Voyage of Maldoon. This is a voyage undertaken for revenge, but vengeance, as Sir Walter Scott has pointed out in his preface to the two drovers, springs in a barbarous society from a passion for justice. And it is this instinct for justice that inspires the Irish hero to endure and to achieve what he does. Christianity has preserved this legend and added to it its own peculiar quality of mercy. And this illustrates one of the characteristics of Ireland's pagan literature. It is imperfectly Christian and can readily be made to express the Christian point of view. Another voyage of pagan Irish literature is the voyage of Bran. In this tale, Idealism is the inspiration that leads the hero into an unknown world. A woman appears who is invisible to all but Bran, and whose song of the beauteous supernatural land beyond the wave is heard by none but him, so that, after refusing to go with her for the first time she appears, at length he steps into her boat of glass and sails away to view the wonders and taste the joys of the other world. In these tales we have two main elements, one real and one ideal. The real element is the fact that the ancient Irish unquestionably made voyages and visited lands which the fervid Celtic imagination and the lapse of time transformed into the wonderful regions of legends. The stories are thus early geographies, and they show unmistakably a knowledge of Western Europe and of the Canary Islands, or some other tropical regions. Perhaps also some have gone so far as to claim they are reminiscent of voyages to America. The ideal element is no less important as indicating achievement, for it shows that the Irish poets of pagan times had not only realized, but had succeeded in making their national traditions embody the fact that love of justice and aspiration for knowledge are the foundations of all enduring human achievement and all perfect human joy. Christianity therefore found moral and spiritual ideas of a highly developed order in pagan Ireland and it did not hesitate to adopt whatever in the literature of the country illustrated its own teachings. And not only were these stories of visits to the other world full of suggestions as to ways of enforcing Christian doctrine, but the Irish Church and men of Irish birth were the most active in spreading the faith in the early centuries of its conquest of Western Europe. For these reasons it is not strange that all the early Christian versions of the spirit world were of Irish origin. We find the earliest in the ecclesiastical history of the Venerable Bede, who died in 735. It is the story of how an Irishman of great sanctity, Perseus by name, was taken in spirit by three angels to a place from which he looked down and saw the four fires that are to consume the world, those of falsehood, avarice, discord, fraud, and impiety. In this there is the germ of some very fundamental things in Dante's poem. And we know that Dante knew Bede, and had probably read his history, for he places him in paradise and mentions him elsewhere in his works. In Bede's work there is also another version, and though in this second case the man who visits the spirit world is not an Irishman, but a Saxon named Drithelm, 
yet the story came to be through an Irish monk named Hengills. So it, too, is connected with Ireland, and it also contains much that is developed further in the Divine Comedy. One of the most celebrated of the works belong to this class of so-called visionary writings is the Fis, or Vision, which goes under the name of the famous Irish saint Adamnan, who was poetically entitled The High Scholar of the Western World. This particular vision, the Fis Adam Nine, is remarkable, among other things, for its literary quality, which is far superior to anything of the time, and for the fact that it represents the highest level of the school to which it belonged, and that it is the most important contribution made to the growth of the legend within the Christian Church prior to the advent of Dante. Another Irish vision of great popularity all over Europe in the Middle Ages is the Voyage of St. Brendan. This is known as the Irish Odyssey, and it is similar to the pagan tales of Maldoon and Bran, except that instead of its hero being a dauntless warrior seeking vengeance or a noble youth seeking happiness, he is a Christian saint in quest of peace, and instead of the perils of the way being overcome by physical force or the favour of some capricious pagan deity, they are averted by the power of faith and virtue. The Voyage of St. Brendan, like its pagan predecessors, has a real and an ideal basis, and in both respects it shows an advancement over its prototypes. It contains some very poetic touches, and is credited with being the source of some of the most effective features of Dante's poem. Its great popularity is shown by the fact that Caxton, the first English printer, published a translation of it in 1483, so that it was among the first books printed in English and for that reason must have been one of the best-known works of the time. Dante undoubtedly knew it, for he was a great scholar in the learning of his day, and especially in ecclesiastical history and the biography of saints. Another vision of Irish origin that Dante and other writers have borrowed from is that of an Irish soldier named Tundale. He is said to have been a very wicked and proud man, who refused to a friend who owed him for three horses an extension of time in which to pay for them, for this he was struck down by an invisible hand, so that he remained apparently dead from Wednesday till Saturday, when he revived and told a story of a visit to a world of the dead that has many features later embodied in the Divine Comedy. Tundale's vision is said to have taken place in 1149. Dante probably wrote his poem between 1314 and 1321. The Irish also produced another legend of this sort that was enormously and universally popular and became the chief authority on the nature of heaven and hell in the story of St. Patrick's Purgatory. St. Patrick was said to have been granted a view of heaven and hell and a certain island in Loch Derg and Donegal was reputed to be the spot in which he had begun his journey. And there it was said those who desired to purge themselves of their sins could enter as he had entered and come back to the world again provided their faith was strong enough. This legend was probably known in Ireland from a very early time, but it had spread all over Western Europe by the 12th century. Henry of Saltry, a Benedictine monk of the abbey of that name in England, wrote an account in Latin of the descent of an Irish soldier named Owen into St. Patrick's Purgatory in 1153, and this story soon became the subject of poetic treatment all over Europe. We have several French versions, one by the celebrated French poetess Marie de France, who lived about 1200 and there are others in all the languages of Europe, besides evidence of its wide circulation in the original Latin. Its importance is shown by the fact that it is mentioned by Matthew Paris, the chief English historian of the 13th century, and also by Frossard, the well-known French analyst of the 14th century, while Calderon, the great Spanish dramatist, has written a play based on the legend. Dante undoubtedly knew of Marie de France's version, as well as the original of Henry de Saltre, and probably others besides. From what has been said, it will be seen that Dante's masterpiece is largely based on literature of Irish origin, but there are other superlative exhibitions of human genius of which the same is true. One of these is the story of Tristan and Isolde. Tristan is the paragon of all knightly accomplishments, the most versatile figure in the entire literature of chivalry, while Isolde is an Irish princess. By a trick of fate, these two drink a love potion inadvertently and become irresistibly enamoured of each other although Isolde is betrothed to King Mark of Cornwall, and Tristan is his nephew and ambassador. The story that follows is infinitely varied, intensely dramatic, delicately beautiful, and tenderly pathetic. It has been treated by several poets of great genius, among them Gottfried of Strasbourg, the greatest German poet of his time, and Richard Wagner, but all the beauty and power in the works of these men existed in the original Celtic form of the tale, 
and the later writers have only discovered it and brought it to light. The same thing is true of the Arthurian legends and the story of the Holy Grail. Dante knew of King Arthur's fame and mentions him in the Inferno. To Dante he was a Christian hero, and the historical Arthur may have been a Christian, but much in the story goes back to the pagan Celtic religion. We can find in Irish literature many references that indicate a belief in a self-sustaining, miraculous object similar to the Holy Grail. And the fact that this object was developed into a symbol of some of the deepest and most beautiful Christian truths show the high character of the civilization and literature of ancient Ireland. References Wright, St. Patrick's Purgatory, London, 1844 Crap, The Legend of St. Patrick's Purgatory, Baltimore, 1900 Becker, Medieval Visions of Heaven and Hell, Baltimore, 1899 Shackford, Legends and Satires, Boston, 1913. Mayer and Nutt, The Voyage of Bran, edited and translated by K. Meyer, with an essay on the Irish version of The Happy Other World and the Celtic Doctrine of Rebirth, by A. Nutt, two volumes, London, 1895. Boswell, an Irish precursor of Dante, London, 1908. End of section 30. Section 31 of The Glories of Ireland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Glories of Ireland, edited by Joseph Dunn and P. J. Lennox. Irish Influence on English Literature by E. C. Quiggin, M. A. Among the literary peoples of the West of Europe, the Irish, in late medieval and early modern times, were singularly little affected by the frequent innovations in taste and theme which influenced Romance and Teutonic nations alike. To such an extent is this true that one is often inclined to think that far-off Iceland was to a greater degree in the general European current than the much more accessible Erin. During the age of chivalry, conditions in Ireland were not calculated to promote the growth of epic and lyric poetry after the continental manner. Some considerable time elapsed before the Norman barons became fully hibernicized, previous to which their interest may be assumed to have turned to the compositions of the Trouvères. In the early Norman period, the poets of Ireland might well have begun to imitate romance models, but strange to say, they did not, and for this various reasons might be assigned. The flowing verses of the Anglo-Norman were impossible for men who delighted in the trammels of the native prosody, and in the heyday of French influence, the patrons of letters in Ireland probably insisted on hearing the foreign compositions in their original dress, as these nobles were doubtless sufficiently versed in Norman French to be able to appreciate them. But a still more potent factor was the conservatism of the hereditary Irish poet families. A close corporation, they appear to have resented every innovation, and were content to continue the tradition of their ancestors. The direct consequence of this tenacious clinging to the fashions of bygone days rendered it impossible, nay, almost inconceivable, that the literary men of Ireland should have exerted any profound or immediate influence upon England or Western Europe. Yet nowadays few serious scholars will be prepared to deny that the island contributed in considerable measure to the common literary stock of the Middle Ages." we might expect to find that direct influence, as a general rule, can be most easily traced in the case of religious themes. Here, in the literature of vision, so popular in Ireland, a chord was struck which continued to vibrate powerfully until the time of the Reformation. In this branch, the riotous fancy of the Celtic monk caught the medieval imagination from an early period. Bede has preserved for us the story of Fursey, an Irish hermit who died in France, A.D. 650. The greatest Irish composition of this class, with which we were acquainted, the vision of Adamnan, does not appear to have been known outside the island, but a later work of a similar nature met with striking success. This was the vision of Tundale, to Nudgal, written in Latin by an Irishman named Marcus at Regensburg, about the middle of the twelfth century. It seems probable that this work was known to Dante, and in addition to the numerous continental versions, there is a rendering of the story into Middle English verse. Closely allied to the visions are the Imrama, or voyages, Latin navigationes. The earliest romances of this class are secular, e.g. Imram Meldwin, 
which provided Tennyson with the framework of his well-known poem. However, the notorious love of adventure on the part of the Irish monks inevitably led to the composition of religious romances of a similar kind. The most famous story of this description, The Voyage of St. Brendan, found its way into every Christian country in Europe, and consequently figures in the South English Legendary, a collection of versified lives of saints made in the neighborhood of Gloucester towards the end of the thirteenth century. The episode of St. Brendan and the Whale, moreover, was probably the ultimate source of one of Milton's best-known similes in his description of Satan. Equally popular was the visit of Sir Owain to the Purgatory of St. Patrick, which is also included in the same Middle English legendary. Ireland further contributed, in some measure, to the common stock of medieval stories which were used as illustrations by the preachers, and in works of an edifying character. When we turn to purely secular themes, we find ourselves on much less certain ground. Though the discussion as to the origins of the romance of Uther's son, Arthur, continues with unabated vigor, many scholars have come to think that the Celtic background of these stories contains much that is derived from Hibernian sources. Some writers in the past have argued in favor of an independent survival of common Celtic features in Wales and Ireland, but now the tendency is to regard all such coincidences as borrowings on the part of Kimrick craftsmen. At the beginning of the twelfth century a new impulse seems to have been imparted to native minstrelsy in Wales, under the patronage of Griffith ap Cynan, Prince of Gwynedd, who had spent many years in exile at the court of Dublin. Some of the Welsh rhapsodists apparently served a kind of apprenticeship with their Irish brethren, and many things Irish were assimilated at this time, which, through this channel, were shortly to find their way into Anglo-French. Thus it may now be regarded as certain that the name of the fair sword Excalibur, by Geoffrey called Caliburnus, Welsh, Calitfilch, is taken from Caladbolg, the far-famed broadsword of Fergus MacRoig. It does not appear that the whole framework of the Irish sagas was taken over, but, as Windish points out, episodes were borrowed, as well as tricks of imagery. So, to mention but one, the central incident of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight is doubtless taken from the similar adventure of Cucallan in Bricria's Feast. The share assigned to Irish influence in the Matière de Bretagne is likely to grow considerably with the progress of research. The fairy lore of Great Britain undoubtedly owes much to Celtic fantasy. Of this Chaucer, at any rate, has little doubt, as he writes, In the old days of the King Arthur, of which that Britain speak in great honour, all was this land fulfilled of fairy, the elf queen with her jolly company danced full oft in many a green maid. And here again there is a reasonable probability that certain features were borrowed from the wealth of story current in the neighboring isle. Otherwise it is difficult to understand why the queen of fairy should bear an Irish name, Mab, from Irish Maeve. And curiously enough, the form of the name Rathaf suggests that it was borrowed through a written medium and not by oral tradition. On the other hand, it is incorrect to derive Puck from Irish Puka, as the latter is undoubtedly borrowed from some form of Teutonic speech. So all embracing a mind as that of the greatest English dramatist could not fail to be interested in the gossip that must have been current in London at the time of the wars in Ulster. References to kerns and gallow-glasses are fairly frequent. He had evidently heard of the marvellous powers with which the Irish bards were credited, for, in As You Like It, Rosalind exclaims, I was never so berimed since Pythagoras's time, that I was an Irish rat, which I can hardly remember. Similarly, in King Richard the Third, mention is made of the prophetic utterance of an Irish bard, a trait which does not appear in the poet's source. Any statements as to Irish influence in Shakespeare that go beyond this belong to the realm of conjecture. Professor Kittredge has attempted to show that in Sir Orfeo, upon which the poet drew for portions of the plot of A Midsummer Night's Dream, the Irish story of Etain and Meter was fused with the medieval form of the classical tale of Orpheus and Eurydice. Direct influence is entirely wanting, and it is difficult to see how it could have been done otherwise. Even in the case of the Elizabethan poet, who spent many years in the south of Ireland, there is no trace of Hibernian lore or legend. Spencer, indeed, tells us himself that he had caused some of the native poetry to be translated to him, and had found that it savoured of sweet wit and good invention. But Ireland plays an infinitesimal part in the Fairy Queen, 
The scenery round Kilcolman Castle forms the background of much of the incident in Book V. Marble far from Ireland brought is mentioned in a simile in the second book, where we also read, "'As when a swarm of gnats at eventide out of the fens of Allen do arise. But Ireland supplied no further inspiration.'" The various plantations of the seventeenth century produced an Anglo-Irish stock which soon asserted itself in literature. As a typical example, we may take the author of The Vicar of Wakefield. At his first school at Lissoy, Oliver Goldsmith came under Thomas Byrne, a regular shanaki, possessed of all the traditional lore, with a remarkable gift for versifying. It was under this man that the boy made his first attempts at verse, and his memory is celebrated in the deserted village. There, in his noisy mansion, skilled to rule, the village master taught his little school. A man severe he was, and stern to view. Unfortunately, Goldsmith was removed to Elfin at the age of nine, and although he retained an affection for Irish music all his life, his intimate connection with Irish Ireland apparently ceased at this point. Sweet Auburn, loveliest village of the plain, is doubtless full of reminiscences of the poet's early years in Westmeath, but the sentiments, the rhythm, and the language are entirely cast in an English mould. We may mention in passing that it has been suggested that Swift derived the idea of the kingdom of Lilliput from the Irish story of the adventures of Fergus MacLeod among the leprechauns. All that can be said is that this derivation is not impossible, though the fact that the tale is preserved only in a single manuscript rather points to the conclusion that the story did not enjoy great popularity in the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries. We have seen that Goldsmith was removed from an Irish atmosphere at a tender age, and this is not the only instance of the frowning of fortune upon the native literature. When the fame of the ancient bards of the Gael was noised from end to end of Europe, it was through the medium of Macpherson's forgeries. Fingal caught the fleeting fancy of the moment in a manner never achieved by the true oceanic lays of Ireland. The Relics of Irish Poetry, published by Miss Brooke, by subscription in Dublin in 1789, to vindicate the antiquity of the literature of Erin, never went into a second edition. And although some of the pieces contained in that volume have been reprinted in such undertakings of a learned character as the volumes of the Dublin Oceanic Society, J. F. Campbell's Lorna Hain and Cameron's Reliquae Celticae, they have aroused little interest among those ignorant of the Irish tongue. During the nineteenth century the number of poets who drew upon Ireland's past for their themes increased considerably. The most popular of all is unquestionably the author of the Irish melodies. But here again, the poet owes little or nothing to vernacular poetry. The mould is English. The sentiments are those of the poet's age. Moore's acquaintance with the native language can have been but of the slightest. And in the case of Mangan, we are told that he had to rely upon literal versions of Irish pieces furnished him by O'Donovan or O'Curry. Of the numerous attempts to reproduce the over-elaboration of rhyme to which Irish verse has ever been prone, Father Prout's Bells of Shandon is perhaps the only one that is at all widely known. When the legendary lore of Iceland became accessible to men of letters, owing to the labors of O'Curry, O'Donovan, and Hennessy, and the publication of various ancient texts by the Irish Archaeological Society, it was to be expected that an attempt would be made by some poet of Erin to do for his native land what the Wizard of the North had accomplished for Scotland. The task was undertaken by Sir Samuel Ferguson, who met with conspicuous success. His most ambitious effort, Conger, deals in epic fashion with the story of the Battle of Moira. Others, in similar strain, treat the story of Conair Mor and Deirdre, whilst others, such as the Tain Quest, are more in the nature of ballads. Ferguson did more to introduce the English reading public to Irish story than would have been accomplished by any number of bald translations. His diction is little affected by the originals, and he sometimes treats his materials with great freedom, but his achievement was a notable one, and he has not infrequently been acclaimed as the national poet. It is perhaps invidious to single out any living author for special mention, but this brief survey cannot close without noticing the dramatic poems of W. B. Yeats, the latest poet who attempts to present the old stories in an English dress. His plays, On Byla's Strand, Deirdre, and others, have become familiar to English audiences through the excellent acting of the members of the Abbey Theatre Company. The original texts are now much better known than they were in Ferguson's day, and Mr. Yeats, consequently, cannot permit himself the same liberties. Similarly, it is only during the last twenty-five years that the language of Irish poetry has been carefully studied, 
and Mr. Yeats, has this advantage over his predecessors, that on occasion, e.g. in certain passages in the King's Threshold, he is able to introduce with great effect reminiscences of the characteristic epithets and imagery which formed so large a part of the stock and trade of the medieval bard. References Friedel and Meyer, La Vision de Tondal, Paris, 1907 Boswell, An Irish Precursor of Dante, London, 1908 Cambridge History of English Literature, Volume 1, Chapters 12 and 16 Windisch, Das Keltische Britannien, Leipzig, 1912 More especially, Chapter 37 Dictionary of National Biography Gwynne Thomas More, English Men of Letters Series, London, 1905 End of section 31section 32 of the glories of ireland this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by linda olson fitak los angeles the glories of ireland edited by joseph dunn and p j lennox section 32 Irish Folklore by Alfred Percival Graves Among savage peoples there is at first no distinction of a definite kind between good and bad spirits, and when a distinction has been reached, a great advance in a spiritual direction has been made. For the key to the religion of savages is fear, and until such terror has been counteracted by belief in beneficent powers, civilization will not follow but the elimination of the fear of the unseen is a slow process indeed it will exist side by side with the belief in christianity itself after a modification through various stages of better pagan belief ireland still presents in its more out-of-the-way districts evidence of that strong persistence in the belief in maleficent or malicious influences of the pre-Christian powers of the air, which it seems difficult to eradicate from the Celtic imagination. In the celebrated poem entitled The Breastplate of St. Patrick, there is much the same attitude on the part of Patrick towards the Druids and their powers of concealing and changing, of paralyzing and cursing, as was shown by Moses towards the magicians of Egypt. Indeed, in Patrick's time, a belief in the world of fairies existed even in the king's household, for when the two daughters of King Leary of Ireland, Ethnia the Fair and Fidelma the Ruddy, came early one morning to the well of Clebach to wash, they found there a synod of holy bishops with Patrick. And they knew not whence they came, or in what form, or from what people, or from what country. But they supposed them to be Dhrin Sheikh, or gods of the earth, or a phantasm. Kogan explains the term Dhrin Sheikh thus. Fantastical spirits, he writes, are by the Irish called men of the Shi, because they are seen, as it were, to come out of the beautiful hills to infest men, and hence the vulgar belief that they reside in certain subterranean habitations, and sometimes the hills themselves are called by the Irish Sheed or Shida. No doubt, when the princesses spoke of the gods of the earth, reference was made to such pagan deities as Baal, Dagda the Great, or the Good God, Aina the Moon, Goddess of the Water and of Wisdom, Mananan Maclear, the Irish Neptune, Chrome, the Irish Ceres, and even the Benevolent, whose relations to the Irish Oirfi resembled those of Apollo towards Orpheus, and to the allegiance they owed to the elements, the wind and the stars. But besides these pagan divinities and powers, and quite apart from them, the early Irish believed in two classes of fairies. In the first place, a hierarchy of fairy beings, well and ill-disposed, 
not differing in appearance, to any degree, and at any rate, from human beings. Good spirits and demons, rarely visible during the daytime. And, in the second place, there was the magic race of the Didanan, who, after conquest by the Venetians, transformed themselves into fairies, and in that guise continued to inhabit the underworld of the Irish hills, and to issue thence in support of Irish heroes, or to give their aid against other fairy adversaries. There is another theory to account for the fairy race. It is that they are angels who revolted with Satan, and were excluded from heaven for their unworthiness, but were not found evil enough for hell, and therefore were allowed to occupy that intermediate space which has been called the other world. It is still a moot point with the Irish peasantry, as it was with the Irish saints of old, whether, after being compelled to dwell without death among rocks and hills, lakes and seas, bushes and forest, till the day of judgment, the fairies then have the chance of salvation. Indeed, the fairies are themselves believed to have great doubts of a future existence, though, like many men, entertaining undefined hopes of happiness, and hence the enmity which some of them have for mankind, who, they acknowledge, will live eternally. Thus their actions are balanced between generosity and vindictiveness towards the human race. Mr. W. Y. Evans Wentz, A.M., of Leland Stanford University, California, and Jesus College, Oxford, has received an honorary degree from the latter university for his thesis, The Fairy Faith in Celtic Countries, Its Psychical Origin and Nature, a most laborious as well as ingenious work, whose object is to prove that the origin of the fairy faith is psychical, and that fairyland, being thought of as an invisible world within which the visible world is immersed as an island in an unexplored ocean, actually exists, and that it is peopled by more species of living beings than this world, because incomparably more vast and varied in its possibilities. This may be added as a fourth theory to account for the existence of fairies, and it may be further stated here that the Irish popular belief in ghosts attributes to some of their departed spirits much of the same violence and malice with which fairies are credited. Mr. Jeremiah Curtin gives striking instances of this kind in his book, The Folklore of West Kerry. It became necessary, therefore, for the Gales who believed in the preternatural powers of the fairies for good and ill to propitiate them as far as possible. On May Eve, accordingly, cattle were driven into wraths and bled there, some of the blood being tasted, the rest poured out in sacrifice. Men and women were also bled on these occasions. The seekers for buried treasure, over which fairies were supposed to have influence, immolated a black cock or a black cat to propitiate them. Again, a cow, suffering from sickness believed to be due to fairy malice, was bled and then devoted to St. Martin. If it recovered, it was never sold or killed. The first new milk of a cow was poured out on a ground, to propitiate the fairies, and especially on the ground within a fairy wrath. The first drop of any drink is also thrown out by old Irish people. If a child spills milk, the mother says, That's for the fairies. Leave it to them and welcome. Slops should never be thrown out of doors without the warning. Take care of water, lest fairies should be passing invisibly and get soiled by the discharge. Eddies of dust upon the road are supposed to be caused by the fairies, and tufts of grass, sticks, and pebbles are thrown into the centre of the eddy to propitiate the unseen beings. Some fairies of life size, who live within the green hills or under the raths, are supposed to carry off healthy babes to be made fairy children, their abstractors leaving weak changelings in their place. Similarly, Nursing mothers are sometimes supposed to be carried off to give the breast to fairy babes, and handsome young men are spirited away to become bridegrooms to fairy brides. 
Again, folk suffering from falling sickness are supposed to be in that condition owing to the fatigue caused by nocturnal rides through the air with the fairies, whose steeds are bewitched rushes, blades of grass, straws, fern roots, and cabbage stalks. The latter, to be serviceable for the purpose, should be cut into the rude shapes of horses before the metamorphosis can take place. Iron of every kind keeps away malignant fairies. Thus, a horseshoe nailed to the bottom of the churn prevents butter from being bewitched. Here is a form of charm against the fairies who have bewitched the butter. Every window should be barred. A great turf fire should be lit upon which nine irons should be placed, the bystanders chanting twice over in Irish, Come, butter, come. Peter stands at the gate waiting for a buttered cake. As the irons become heated, the witch will try to break in, asking the people to take the irons which are burning her off the fire. On their refusing, she will go and bring back the butter to the churn. The irons may then be removed from the fire, and all will go well. If a neighbor or stranger should enter a cottage during the churning, he should put his hand to the dash, or the butter will not come. A small piece of iron should be sewed into an infant's clothes and kept there until the child is baptized, and salt should be sprinkled over his cradle to preserve the babe from abduction. The fairies are supposed to have been conquered by an iron-weaponed race, and hence their dread of the metal. To recover a spellbound friend, stand on All Hallows' Eve at crossroads or at a spot pointed out by a wise woman or a fairy doctor. When you have rubbed fairy ointment on your eyelids, the fairies will become visible as the host sweeps by with its captive, whom the gazer will then be able to recognize. A sudden gust announces their approach. Stooping down, you will then throw dust or milk at the procession, whose members are then obliged to surrender your spellbound friend. If a man leaves home after his wife's confinement, some of his clothes should be spread over the mother and infant, or the fairies may carry them off. It is good for a woman, but bad for a man, to dream of fairies. It betokens marriage for a girl, misfortune for a man, who should not undertake serious business for some time after such dreaming. Fairy changelings may be recognized by tricky habits, constant crying, and other unusual characteristics. It was customary to recover the true child in the following way. The changeling was placed upon an iron shovel over the fire when it would go shrieking up the chimney and the bona fide human child would be restored. It was believed that fairy changelings often produced a set of small bagpipes from under the clothes and played dance music upon them till the inmates of the cottage dropped with exhaustion from the effects of the step-dancing they were compelled to engage in. On Samhain Eve the night before the first of November, or, as it is now called, All Hallows' Night, or Halloween, all the fairy hills or shees are thrown wide open, and the fairy host issues forth, as mortals who are bold enough to venture near may see. Naturally, therefore, people keep indoors so as not to encounter the spectral host. The superstition that the fairies are abroad on Samhain night still exists in Ireland and Scotland, and there is a further belief, no doubt derived from it, that the graves are open on that night, and that the spirits of the dead are abroad. Salt, as already suggested, is regarded to be so lucky that if a child falls, he should always be given three pinches of salt, and if a neighbor calls to borrow salt, it should not be refused, even though it be the last grain in the house. An infant born with teeth should have them drawn by the nearest smith, and the first teeth, when shed, should be thrown into the fire, lest the fairies should get hold of what had been a part of you. Those who hear fairy music are supposed to be haunted by the melody, and many are believed to go mad or commit suicide in consequence. 
the fairies are thought to engage in warfare with one another, and in the year 1800 a specially sanguinary battle was believed to have been fought between two clans of the fairies in County Kilkenny. In the morning the hawthorns among the fences were found crushed to pieces and drenched with blood. In popular belief, fairies often go hunting, and faint sounds of fairy horns, the baying of fairy hounds, and the crackling of fairy whips are supposed to be heard on these occasions, while the flight of the hunters is said to resemble in sound the humming of bees. Besides the life-sized fairies, who are reputed to have these direct dealings with human beings, there are diminutive preternatural beings who are also supposed to come into close touch with men. Among these is the Luchriman, Le Hrogan, or Brogmaker, otherwise known as Leprechaun. He is always found mending or making a shoe, and, if grasped firmly and kept constantly in view, will disclose hidden treasure to you, or render up his Sparona Schillinge, or purse of the inexhaustible shilling. He can only be bound by a plough chain or woollen thread. He is the symbol of industry which, if steadily faced, leads to fortune, but if lost sight of, is followed by its forfeiture. Love in idleness is personified by another pygmy, the Jenkanach, love talker. He does not appear like the leprechaun, with a purse in one of his pockets, but with his hands in both of them, and a dudeen, short pipe, in his mouth, as he lazily strolls through lonely valleys making love to the foolish country lasses and gostering with the idle boys. To meet him meant bad luck, and whoever was ruined by ill-judged love was said to have been with the Jean Connach. Another evil sprite was the clubber chan, a jolly, red-faced, drunken little fellow, always found astride of a wine-butt, singing and drinking from a full tankard in a hard drinker's cellar, and bound by his appearance to bring its owner to a speedy ruin. Then there were the lanon sheikhs, or native muses, to be found in every place of note to inspire the local bard, and the banshees, banshees, fairy women, attached to each of the old Irish families and giving warning of the death of one of its members with piteous lamentations. Black Joanna of the Boyne, Shubanduch na Boyne, appeared on Halloween in the shape of a great black fowl, bringing luck to the home whose banity, woman of the house, kept the dwelling constantly clean and neat. The puka, who appeared in the shape of a horse, and whom Shakespeare is by many believed to have adapted as Puck, was a goblin who combined horseplay with viciousness, but also at times helped with the housework. The Dulagan was a churchyard demon, whose head was of a movable kind, Dr. Joyce writes. You generally meet him with his head in his pocket, under his arm, or absent altogether. Or if you have the fortune to light upon a number of the dooligans, you may see them amusing themselves by flinging their heads at one another, or kicking them for footballs. An even more terrible churchyard demon is the fascinating phantom that waylays the widower at his wife's very tomb, and poisons him by her kiss when he has yielded to her blandishments. Of monsters the Irish had and still believe in, the piast, Latin bestia, huge dragon or serpent confined to lakes by St. Patrick till the day of judgment, but still occasionally seen in their waters. In old Finian times, namely the days of Finn and his companion knights, the piasts, however, roamed the country, devouring men and cattle in large numbers, and some of the early heroes are recorded to have been swallowed alive by them, and then to have hewed their way out of their entrails. Marrows, or mermaids, 
are also still believed in, and many folk tales still exist describing their intermarriage with mortals. According to Nicholas O'Kearney, it is the general opinion of many old persons versed in native traditional lore that before the introduction of Christianity, all animals possessed the faculties of human reason and speech, and old storytellers will gravely inform you that every beast could speak before the arrival of St. Patrick, but that the saint, having expelled the demons from the land by the sound of his bell, all the animals that, before that time, had possessed the power of foretelling future events, such as the black steed of Bianachlabra, the royal cat of Clomachrichcat, Cloch, and others became mute, and many of them fled to Egypt and other foreign countries. Cats are said to have been appointed to guard hidden treasures, and there are few who have not heard old Irish people tell about strange meetings of cats and violent battles fought by them in the neighborhood. It was believed, adds O'Kearney, that an evil spirit in the shape of a cat assumed command over these animals in various districts, and that when these wicked beings pleased, they could compel all the cats belonging to their divisions to attack those of some other district. The same was said of rats and rat expellers. When commanding a colony of those troublesome and destructive animals to emigrate to some other place, used to address their billet to the infernal rat, supposed to hold command over the rest. In a curious pamphlet on the power of bardic compositions to charm and expel rats, lately published, Mr. Eugene O'Curry states that a degraded priest who was descended from an ancient family of hereditary bards was enabled to expel a colony of rats by the force of satire. Hence, of course, Shakespeare's reference to rhyming Irish rats to death. It will thus be seen that Irish fairy lore well deserves to have been called by Mr. Alfred Nutt, one of the leaning authorities on the subject, as fair and bounteous a harvest of myth and romance as ever flourished among any race. References Alex Carmichael Carmina Gadelica David Comin the Boyish Exploits of Finn, The Periodical Folklore, Lady Gregory, Cuchulain of Muirthemna, Gods and Fighting Men, Miss Eleanor Hull, The Cuchulain Saga in Irish Literature, Douglas Hyde, Beside the Fire, A Collection of Gaelic Irish Folk Stories, Lebar Shelecha, Folk Stories in Irish, Irish Penny Journal, Patrick Kennedy, the Fireside Stories of Ireland, Legendary Fictions of the Irish Celt, Standish Hayes O'Grady, Silva Gadelica, Wood Martin, Traces of the Elder Faiths in Ireland, Pagan Ireland, W. Y. Wentz, The Fairy Faith in Celtic Countries, Lady Wilde, Charms, Incantations, etc., Celtic Articles in Hastings Dictionary of Religion and Ethics. End of section 32. Section number 33 of The Glories of Ireland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Glories of Ireland, edited by Joseph Dunn and P.J. Lennox. Section number 33. Irish Wit and Humor by Charles L. Graves. No record of the glories of Ireland would be complete without an effort, however inadequate, to analyze and illustrate her wit and humor. Often misunderstood, misrepresented, and misinterpreted, they are nevertheless universally admitted to be racial traits, and for an excellent reason. Other nations exhibit these qualities in their literature and Ireland herself is rich in writers who have furnished food for mirth. But her special preeminence resides in the possession of what, to adapt a famous phrase, may be called in anima naturaliter jacosa. Irish wit and Irish humor are a national inheritance. They are inherent in the race as a whole, independent of education, 
or culture or comfort. The best Irish sayings are the sayings of the people. The greatest Irish humorists are the nameless multitude who have never written books or found a place in national dictionaries of biography. None but an Irishman could have coined that supreme expression of contempt. I wouldn't be seen dead with him at a pig fair, or rebuked a young barrister because he did not squander his carcass, for example, gesticulate enough. But we cannot trace the paternity of these sayings any more than we can that of the lightning retort of the man to whom one of the quality had given a glass of whiskey. That's made another man of you, Patsy, remarked the donor. Deed it has, sor, Patsy flashed back. And that other man would be glad of another glass. It is enough for our purpose to note that such sayings are typically Irish and that their peculiar felicity consists in their combining both wit and humor. To what element is the Irish nature are we to attribute this joyous and illuminating gift? No one who is not a Gaelic scholar can venture to dogmatize on this thorny subject. But setting philology and politics aside, it is hard to avoid the conclusion that Ireland has gained rather than lost in this respect by the clash of races and languages. Gaiety, we are told, is not the predominating characteristic of the Celtic temperament, nor is it reflected in the prose and verse of the old ancient days that have come down to us. Glamour and magic and passion abound in the lays and legends of the ancient Gael, but there is more melancholy than mirth in these tales of long ago. Indeed, it is interesting to note in connection with this subject that the younger school of Irish writers associated with what is called the Celtic Renaissance have, with very few exceptions, sedulously eschewed anything approaching to jocosity, preferring the paths of crepuscular mysticism or somber realism, and openly avowing their distaste for what they consider to be the denationalized sentiment of Moore, Lovar, and Lover. To say this is not to disparage the genius of Yeats and Singh, it is merely a statement of fact and an illustration of the eternal dualism of the Irish temperament, which Moore himself realized when he wrote of Aaron the tear and the smile in thine eye. A reaction against the Donnybrook tradition was inevitable, and to great extent wholesome, since the stage Irishman of the transpotine drama or the music halls was for most part a gross and unlovely caricature. But, like all reactions, it has tended to be obscure, the real merits and services of those who showed the other side of the medal. Lever did not exaggerate more than Dickens, and his portraits of Galway fox hunters and duelists, of soldiers of fortune, and of Dublin undergraduates were largely based on fact. At his best was a most exhilarating companion, and his pictures of Irish life, if partial, were not misleading. He held no brief for the landlords, and in his later novels showed a keen sense of their shortcomings. The plain fact is that, in considering the literary glories of Ireland, we cannot possibly overlook the work of those Irishmen who were affected by English influences or wrote for an English audience. Anglo-Irish humorous literature was a comparatively late product, but its efflorescence was rapid and triumphant. The first great name is that of Goldsmith, and, though deeply influenced in technique and choice of subjects by his association with English men of letters and by his residence in England, in spirit he remained Irish to the end, generous, impulsive, and improvident in his life, genial, gay, and tender-hearted in his works. The vicar of Wakefield was Dr. Primrose, but he might just as well have been called Dr. Shamrock. No surer proof of the preeminence of Irish wit and humor can be found than in the fact that, Shakespeare alone excepted, no writers of comedy have held the boards longer or more triumphantly than Goldsmith and his brother Irishman Sheridan. She stoops to conquer. The rivals, the school for scandal, and the critic represent the sunny side of the Irish genius to perfection. They illustrate in the most convincing way possible how the debt of the world to Ireland has been increased by the fate which ordained that her choicest spirits should express themselves in a language of wider appeal than the ancient speech of Aaron. On the other hand, English literature and the English tongue have gained greatly from the influence exerted by writers familiar from their childhood with turns of speech and modes of expression which, even when they are not translations, 
from the Gaelic, are characteristic of the Hibernian temper. The late Dr. P. W. Joyce, in his admirable treatise on English, as spoken in Ireland, has illustrated not only the essentially bilingual character of the Anglo-Irish dialect, but the modes of thought which it enshrines. There is no better known form of Irish humor than that commonly called the Irish bowl, which is too often set down to lax thinking and faulty logic. But it is the rarest thing to encounter a genuine Irish bull which is not picturesque and at the same time highly suggestive. Take, for example, the saying of an old Kerry doctor who, when conversing with a friend on the high rate of mortality, observed, Bedad, there's people dying who never died before. Here a truly illuminating result was attained by the simple device of using the indicative for the conditional mood. As in Juvenal's Famous comment on Cicero's second Philippe. Antoni gladios foti contemner si sic omnia dixent. The Irish bull is a heroic and sometimes successful attempt to sit upon two stools at once. Or as an Irishman put it, Englishmen often make bulls, but the Irish bull is always pregnant. Though no names of such outstanding distinction as those of Goldsmith and Sheridan, occur in the early decades of the nineteenth century the spirit of irish comedy was kept vigorously alive by maria edgeworth william magnan francis mahoney father prout and william carleton sir walter scott's splendid tribute to the genius of maria edgeworth is regarded by some critics as extravagant but it is largely confirmed in a most unexpected quarter turgeniev the great russian novelist proclaimed himself her disciple, and has left it on record that but for her example he might never have attempted to give literary form to his impressions of the classes in Russia corresponding to the poor Irish and the squireens and the squires of County Langford. Magine and Mahoney were both scholars. The latter, happily called himself an Irish potato seasoned with Attic salt, wrote largely for English periodicals, and spent most of their lives out of Ireland. In the writings of all three of an element of the grotesque is observable, tempered, however, in the case of Mahoney, with the vein of tender pathos, which emerges in his delightful Bells of Shandon. McGean was a wit, Mahoney was the hedge schoolmaster in Excelsis, and Carleton was the first realist in Irish peasant fiction, but all alike drew their best inspiration from essentially Irish themes. The pendulum has swung back slowly, but steadily, since the days when Irish men of letters found it necessary to accommodate their genius to purely English literary standards. Even Lever, though he wrote for the English public, wrote mainly about Ireland. So, too, with his contemporary, Le Fanu, whose reputation rests on a double basis. He made some wonderful excursions into the realm of the bizarre, the uncanny, and the gruesome. But in the collection known as the Purcell Papers, we found three short stories which for exuberant drollery and diversion have never been excelled. That the same man could have written Uncle Silas and the Quarjander is yet another proof of the strange dualism of Irish character. The record of the last fifty years shows an uninterrupted progress in the invasion of the English Bell's letters by Irish writers. Outside literature, perhaps the most famous sayer of good things of our times was a simple Irish parish priest, the late Father Healy. Of his humorous sayings, the number is legion. His wit may be illustrated by a less familiar example. His comment on a very tall young lady named Lynch. Nature gave her an inch, and she took an L. In the House of Commons today, there is no greater master of irony and sardonic humor than his namesake, Mr. Tim Healy. On one occasion, he remarked that Lord Rosebery was not a man to go tire-shooting with, except at the zoo. On another, being anxious to bring an indictment against the castle regime in Dublin, and finding the way blocked by a debate on Uganda, he successfully accomplished his purpose by a judicious geographical transference of names, and convulsed the house by a speech in which the nomenclature of Central Africa was applied to the government of Ireland, but wit and humor are the monopoly of no class or calling in Ireland. They flourish alike among car drivers, and Casey's publicans and policemen, priests and parsons, 
beggars and peers. It is commonplace of criticism to deny these qualities in their highest form to women. But this is emphatically untrue of Ireland, and was never more conclusively disproved than by the recent literary achievements of her daughters. The partnership of two Irish ladies, Miss Edith Somerville and Miss Violet Martin, has given us, in some experiences, of an Irish R.M., for example, resident magistrate. The most delicious comedy, and in the real Charlotte, the finest tragedy comedy that have come out of Great Britain in the last thirty years. The R.M., as it is familiarly called, is already a classic. But the Irish comedy humane, to use the phrase in the sense of Balzac, is even more vividly portrayed in the pages of the real Charlotte. Humor, genuine, though intermittent, irradiates the autumnal talent of Miss Jane Barlow, and the long roll of gifted Irish women who have contributed to the gaiety of nations may be closed with the names of Miss Hunt, author of folk tales of Breffney, of Miss Perdone, and Miss Winifred Letts, who in prose and verse, respectively, have moved us to tears and laughter by their studies of Lanaster peasant life, and of Maura O'Neill, Mrs. Scrine, the imperable singer of the glens of Antrium, and to give a full list of the living Irish writers, male and female, who are engaged in the benevolent work of driving dull care away, would be impossible within the space at our command. But we cannot end without recognition of our exhilarating extravaganzas of George A. Birmingham, Canon Hannay, the freakish and elfin muse of James Stevens, and the coruscating wit of F. P. Dunn, the famous Irish American humorist, whose Mr. Dooley is a household word on both sides of the Atlantic. References Goldsmith, Vicar of Wakefield, She Stoops to Conquer, Sheridan, The Rivals, The School for Scandal, The Critic, R. Edgeworth, Essay on Irish Bulls, M. Edgeworth, Castle Rackrent, The Absentee, McGinn, Miscellanies in Prose and Verse, Carlton, Traits and Stories of the Irish Peasantry, Mahoney, Father Prout, Relics of Father Prout, John and Michael Bannum, Tales of the O'Hara Family, Lover, Legends, and Stories of Ireland, Andy Andy, Lever, Harry, Michael Bannum, Tales of the O'Hara Family, Lover, Legends, and Stories of Ireland, Andy Andy, Lever, Harry, Laura Creer, Charles O'Malley, Lord Kilgobbin, Le Fanu, Le Purcell Papers, Barlow, Bogland Studies, Irish Ideals, Irish Neighbors, Birmingham, The Seething Pot, Spanish Gold, The Major's Niece, The Red Hand of Ulster, General John Reagan, Stevens, The Crock of Gold, Here Are Ladies, Hunt, The Folk Tales of Breffney, Perdone, The Folk of Furry Farm, Somerville and Ross, The Real Charlotte, Some Experiences of an Irish R.M., All on the Irish Shore. Dan Russell, the Fox. End of section number 33. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. Section 34 of the Glories of Ireland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Linda Olson Fytak, Los Angeles The Glories of Ireland, edited by Joseph Dunn and P. J. Lennox Section 34 The Irish Theatre by Joseph Holloway the Irish theatre and secular drama may be said to begin with the production of James Shirley's historical play St. Patrick for Ireland in Werborough Street Theatre about 1636 to 7. And although Dublin was a great school for acting and supplied many of the best players to the English stage, such as Quinn, Macklin, Peg Woofington, Miss O'Neill, and hosts of others, it never really possessed a creative theatre, save at the Capel Street Theatre for a few years during the Grattan Parliament, until the modern movement in Ireland came into being and the Abbey Theatre became its headquarters. 
Of course, innumerable plays by Irish writers were written, but most of them were not distinctively Irish in character, and the names of Goldsmith, Sheridan, O'Keefe, Farquhar, Sheridan Knowles, Oscar Wilde, and dozens of others will always be remembered as great Irish writers for the stage. And when fine impersonators of Irish character, like Tyrone Power, John Drew, or Barney Williams arrived, there were always to be found several clever writers to fit them with parts, the demand always creating the supply. Even before Dion Boucicault took to writing Irish dramas of a more palatable and less stage Irish character than those of his immediate predecessors, some excellent plays, Irish in character and tone, had from time to time found their way to the stage. However, Boucicault sweetened our stage by the production of the Colleen Baum, Arana Pogue, the Chagrin, and showed by his rollicking impersonations of Miles, Sean, and Con, how good-humoured, hearty, and self-sacrificing Irish boys in humble life can be. He had great technical knowledge of stagecraft, and that has helped to make his Irish plays live in the popular goodwill right up to today. A revolt against Boussicault's Irish boys all fun and frolic, and charming Colleen's, who could do no wrong, has made our modern playwrights go to the other extreme, so that now we find our stage peopled with peasants, cruel, hard, and forbidding for the most part, and with Colleen's, who are the reverse of lovable in thought or act. Neither picture is quite true of our people. What is really wanted is the happy medium, which few, if any, of our new playwrights have yet given us. If our great popular Irish drama has yet to come, I think the Fays have made it possible to say that a distinct and really fine dramatic school has arisen in Ireland and evolved out of their wonderful skill in teaching, producing, and acting. And if we are not always really delighted with what our playwrights give us, the almost perfect way in which the plays are served up by the actors invariably wholly satisfies. It is the actors who have made the Abbey Theatre famous, and not the plays. Such acting as theirs cast a spell over all who see them. What pleasing memories do the names of W. G. Fay, Frank J. Fay, Dudley Diggs, Sarah Allgood, Arthur Sinclair, Mayor O'Neill, Mayor Nishui Lebach, J. M. Kerrigan, Fred O'Donovan, Eileen O'Doherty, Una O'Connor, Eith Nimagi, Nora Desmond, and John Connolly recall. With the production of W. B. Yeats' poetic one-act play, The Land of Heart's Desire, at the Avenue Theatre, London, on March 29, 1894, began the modern Irish dramatic movement. When the poet had tasted the joys of the footlights, he longed to see an Irish literary theatre realised in Ireland. Five years later, in the ancient concert rooms, Dublin, on May 9, 1899, his play, the Countess Kathleen was produced and his desire gratified. The experiment was tried for three years and then dropped. Plays by Yeats, Edward Martin, George Moore, and Alice Milligan were staged with English-trained actors in the casts. And a Gaelic play, the first ever presented in a theatre in Ireland, was also given during the third season. It was The Twisting of the Rope by Dr. Douglas Hyde and was played at the Gaiety Theatre Dublin on October 21st, 1901 by a Gaelic Amateur Dramatic Society coached by W. G. Fay. The author filled the principal part with distinction. It was while rehearsing this play that the thought came to Fay. Why not have my little company of Irish-born actors 
the Ormond Dramatic Society appear in plays by Irish writers instead of in the ones they have been giving for years. And the thought soon ripened into realization. His brother, Frank, had dreamed of such a company since he read of the small beginnings out of which the Norwegian theatre had grown. And just then, seeing some of A's, George Russell's play, Deirdre, in the All-Ireland Review, he asked the author if he would allow them to produce it. And, consent being given, the company put it into rehearsal at once. A got for them from Yeats, Kathleen Nihulehan, to make up the program. Thus it was that this company of amateurs and poets, now known as the Abbey Players, came into existence, and at St. Teresa's Hall, Clarendon Street, Dublin, gave their first performance on April 2nd, 1902. Shortly afterwards, they took a hall at the back of a shop in Camden Street, where they rehearsed and gave a few public performances. On A declining to be their president, Frank Fay suggested the name of W. B. Yeats, and he was elected, and in that way came again into the movement in which he has figured so largely ever since. The company played occasionally in the Molesworth Hall, and produced there, among other pieces, Sings in the Shadow of the Glen, October 8, 1903 and Riders to the Sea, February 25, 1904, Yeats's The Hourglass, March 14, 1903, and The King's Threshold, October 8, 1903, Lady Gregory's 25, March 14, 1903, and Padre Colum's Broken Soil, December 3, 1903. On March 26, 1904, the company paid a flying one-day visit to the Royalty London, and Miss A. E. F. Horniman, who had given Shaw, Yeats, and Dr. John Todhunter their first real start as playwrights at the Avenue, London, in March-April, 1894. Shaw had had his first play, Widower's Houses, played by the Independent Theatre in 1892 saw the performance, and was so impressed that she thought she would like to find a suitable home for such talent in Dublin, and fixed upon the Old Mechanics Institute and its surrounding buildings, and there the Abbey Theatre soon afterwards, on December 27, 1904, came into existence. In writing of this Irish dramatic movement, one must always bear in mind that it was Yeats who first conceived the idea of such a movement, the Fays who founded the school of Irish acting, and Miss Horniman who, like a fairy godmother, waved the wand and gave it a habitation and a name, the Abbey Theatre, and endowed it for six years. Play followed play with great rapidity, and dramatic societies sprang up all over the country, playing home-made productions in Gaelic and English. All Ireland seemed to be play-acting and play-writing, so much so that Frank Fay was heard to say that he thought everyone had a play in his pocket and that anyone in the street could be picked up and shaped into an actor or actress with a little training. Ireland was so teeming with talent. Dramatic Ireland had slumbered for a long while and awoke with tremendous vigor for work. New dramatists sprang up in all parts of Ireland. The Ulster Literary Theatre started in Belfast, the Cork Dramatic Society in Cork, the Theatre of Ireland in Dublin, and others in Galway and Waterford soon followed. In Dublin at present, more than half a dozen dramatic societies are continually producing new plays and discovering new acting talent. There are also two Gaelic dramatic societies, and nearly every town in Ireland now has its own dramatic class and its own dramatists. All this activity has come about within the last ten or twelve years, where before 
in many places drama and acting were almost unknown many gaelic societies throughout the country put on gaelic plays by dr douglas hyde pierce beasley thomas haynes canon peter o'leary and others and the oerechtas the gaelic musical and literary festival held each year in dublin usually presents several irish plays and offers prizes for new ones at each festival of all the irish playwrights who have arisen in recent years lady gregory has produced most and w b yeats is the most poetic he is more a lyric poet than a dramatist and is never satisfied with his work for the stage but keeps eternally chopping and changing it his kathleen Nihulahan, though a dream play always appeals to an audience of irish people perhaps his one act deirdre is the nearest approach to real drama he has done some of lady gregory's earlier one-act farces such as the workhouse ward are very amusing the rising of the moon is a little dramatic gem and the gale gate is touched with genuine tragedy singh wrote only one play riders to the sea that acts well the others are admired by critics for the strangeness of their diction and the beauty of the nature pictures scattered through them his much discussed playboy of the western world has become famous for the rows it has created at home and abroad from its very first production on january twenty sixth nineteen o seven william boyle who gets to the heart of those he writes about has produced the most popular play of the movement in the eloquent dempsey and a perfectly constructed one in the building fund w f casey's two plays the man who missed the tide and the suburban groove are both popular and actable padre colum's plays the land and broken soil the latter rewritten and renamed the fiddler's house are almost idyllic scenes of country life lennox robinson's plays are harsh in tone but dramatically effective and t c murray's birthright and maurice hart are fine dramas well constructed and full of true knowledge of the people he writes about shomas o'kelly has written two strong dramas in the schuler's child and the bribe and shomas o'brien one of the funniest irish farces ever staged in duty r j ray's play the casting out of martin whelan is the best this dramatist has as yet given us and george fitzmaurice's the country dressmaker has the elements of good drama in it st john g irvine has written a very human drama in mixed marriage he hails from the north of ireland but rutherford maine is the best of the northern playwrights and his plays the drone and the turn of the road are splendid homely county down comedies bernard shaw's john bull's other island as irish plays go is a fine specimen canon hannay has written two successful comedies eleanor's enterprise and general john reagan the latter not wholly to the taste of the people of the west james stevens and jane barlow have also tried their hands at playwriting with but moderate success perhaps the modern drama that made the most impression when first played was the heatherfield by edward martin it gripped and remains a lasting memory with all who saw it in eighteen ninety nine but i think i have written enough to show that the irish theatre of to-day is in a very alive condition and that if the great national dramatist has not yet arrived he is sure to emerge when that time comes the actors are here 
ready to interpret such work to perfection. An article, however brief, on the Irish theatre would be incomplete without mention of the world-famous tragedians John Edward McCullough, Lawrence Patrick Barrett, and Barry Sullivan, of genial comedians like Charles Sullivan and Hubert O'Grady, of sterling actors like Sheil Barry, John Brogham, Leonard Boyne, J. D. Beveridge, and Thomas Nerney, or of operatic artists like Dennis O'Sullivan and Joseph O'Mara, many of whom have passed away, but some, fortunately, are with us still. References John Genist Some Account of the English Stage from the Restoration to 1830 1832 Volume 10 is devoted to the Irish Stage. Chetwood General History of the Stage more particularly of the Irish Theatre, Dublin, 1749. Malloy, Romance of the Irish Stage. Baker, Biografia Dramatica, Dublin, 1782. Hitchcock, An Historical View of the Irish Stage from its Earliest Period Down to the Season of 1788. Doran, Their Majesty's Servants, or Annals of the English Stage, London, 1865. Hughes, The Pre-Victorian Drama in Dublin. The History of the Theatre Royal, Dublin, Dublin, 1870. Levy and O'Rourke, Annals of the Theatre Royal, Dublin, 1880. O'Neill, Irish Theatrical History, Dublin, 1910. Brown, A Guide to Books on Ireland, Dublin, 1912. Lawrence, The Abbey Theatre, in the Weekly Freeman, Dublin, December, 1912. Origin of the Abbey Theatre, in Sinn Féin, Dublin, February 14, 1914. Vagant, Irish Plays and Playwrights, London, 1913. Lady Gregory, Our Irish Theatre, London, 1914. Bourgeois, John M. Singh and the Irish Theatre, London, 1913. Moore, Hail and Farewell, Three Volumes, London, 1911. 1914. Asmore, The Ulster Literary Theatre, in The Lady of the House, Dublin, November 15th, 1913. The Reviews, Beltane, 1899-1900, to and Samhain, 1901-1903. to End of section number 34. Section 35 of The Glories of Ireland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. The Glories of Ireland. Edited by Joseph Dunn and P.J. Lennox. Irish Journalists by Michael MacDonald The most splendid testimony to the Irish genius in journalism is afforded by the London press of the opening decades of the 20th century. One of the greatest newspaper organizers of modern times is Lord Northcliffe. As the principal proprietor and guiding mind of both the Times and the Daily Mail, he directly influences public opinion from the steps of the throne and the door of the cabinet to the errand boy and the servant maid. T. P. O'Connor, M.P., is the most popular writer on current social and political topics, and so amazing in his versatility that every subject he touches is illumined by those fine qualities, vision, and sincerity. 
The most renowned of political writers is J. L. Garvin of the Pall Mall Gazette and The Observer. By his leading articles, he has done as much as the late Joseph Chamberlain by his speeches to democratize and humanize the old Tory party of England. The authoritative special correspondent, studying at first hand all the problems which divide the nations of Europe, and knowing personally most of its rulers and statesmen, is E. J. Dillon of the Daily Telegraph. And when the quarrels of nations are transferred from the chancelleries to the stricken field, there is no one among the war correspondents more enterprising and intrepid in his methods, or more picturesque and vivid with his pen, than M. H. Donahoe of the Daily Chronicle. All these men are Irish. Could there be more striking proof of the natural bent and aptitude of the Irish mind for journalism? Dean Swift was the mightiest journalist that ever stirred the sluggish soul of humanity. Were he alive today, and had he at his command the enormous circulation of a great daily newspaper, he would keep millions in a perpetual mental ferment. Such was the ferocious indignation into which he was aroused by wrong and injustice, and his gift of savage, ironical expression. Swift, as a young student in Trinity College, Dublin, saw the birth of the first offspring of the Irish mind in journalism. The Dublin Newsletter made its appearance in June 1685, and was published every three or four days for the circulation of news and advertisements. Only one copy of the first issue of this, the earliest of Irish newspapers, is extant. It is included in the Thorpe Collection of Tracts in the Royal Dublin Society. Dated August 26, 1685, it consists of a single leaf of paper printed on both sides, and contains just one item of news, a letter brought by the English packet from London, and two local advertisements. As I reverently handled it, I was thrilled by the thought that from this insignificant little seed sprang the great national organ, the Freeman's Journal, the press of the United Irishmen, the nation of the Young Irelanders, the United Ireland of the Land League, the Irish World, and the Boston Pilot of the American Irish, and the Irish Independent, the first halfpenny Dublin morning paper, and the most widely circulated of Irish journals. If Swift did not write for the Dublin newsletter, he certainly wrote for the Examiner, a weekly miscellany published in the Irish capital from 1710 to 1713, and the first journal that endeavored to create public opinion in Ireland. It was at Swift's instigation that this paper was started, and he was doubtless encouraged to suggest it by the success that attended his articles in the contemporary London publication of the same name, the Tory Examiner, in which his journalistic genius was fully revealed. As it has been expressively put, he wrote his friends, Harley and St. John, into a firm grip of power, and thus, as in other ways, contributed his share to the inauguration and maintenance of that policy which, in the last four years of Queen Anne, so materially recast the whole European situation. About the same time, there appeared in London the earliest forms of the periodical essay in The Tatler and the Spectator, which exhibit the comprehensiveness of the Irish temperament in writing by affording a contrast between the Irish force and vehemence of Swift and the Irish play of kindly wit and tender pathos and the deft and dainty periods of Richard Steele. Dr. Charles Lucas was, even more than Swift, perhaps, the precursor of that type of Irish publicist and journalist, of which there have been many splendid examples since then in Ireland, England, and America. Lucas first started the Censor, a weekly journal, in 1748. Within two years, his paper was suppressed for exciting discontent with the government, and to avoid a prosecution, he fled to England. 
in seventeen sixty three the freeman's journal was established by three dublin merchants lucas who had returned from a long exile and was a member of the irish parliament contributed to it sometimes anonymously but generally over the signature of a citizen or civis the editor was henry brooks novelist poet and playwright his novel the fool of quality is still read his tragedy the earl of essex was wrongly supposed to contain a precept who rules or freeman should himself be free which led to the more famous parody of dr samuel johnson who drives fat oxen should himself be fat the object of lucas and brooke as journalists was to awaken national sentiment by teaching that ireland had an individuality of her own independently of england but they were more convinced with the assertion of the constitutional rights of the parliament of the protestant colony as against the domination of england therefore the first organ of irish nationality representative of all creeds and classes was the press the newspaper of the united irishmen which was started in dublin in seventeen ninety seven by arthur o'connor the son of a rich merchant who had made his money in london its editor was peter finnerty born of humble parentage at loray afterwards a famous parliamentary reporter for the london morning chronicle and its most famous contributor was dr william drennan the poet who first called ireland the emerald isle irishmen did not become prominently associated with american journalism until after the famine and the collapse of the young ireland movement in eighteen forty eight the journalist whom i regard as having exercised the most faithful influence on the destinies of ireland was charles gavan duffy the founder and first editor of the nation a newspaper of which it was truly and finally said that it brought a new soul into erin among its contributors who afterwards added lustre to the journalism of the united states was john mitchell in the southern citizen and the richmond inquirer he supported the south against the north in the civil war the rev abram joseph ryan who was associated with journalism in new orleans not only acted as a catholic chaplain with the confederate army but sang of its hopes and aspirations in tuneful verse serving in the army of the north was charles g halpine whose songs signed private miles o'reilly were very popular in those days of national convulsion in the united states halpine's father had edited the tory newspaper the dublin evening mail and halpine himself after the war edited the citizen of new york famous for its advocacy of reforms in civic administration perhaps the two most renowned men in irish american journalism were john boyle o'reilly of the boston pilot and patrick ford of the irish world o'reilly was a troop sergeant in the tenth hussars prince of wales own and during the fenian troubles of eighteen sixty six had eighty of his men ready armed and mounted to take out of island bridge barracks dublin at a given signal to aid the projected insurrection detected he was brought to trial summarily convicted and sentenced to be shot this sentence was commuted to twenty-five years penal servitude but o'reilly survived it all to become a brilliant man of letters and make the boston pilot one of the most influential irish and catholic newspapers in the united states ford who had served his apprenticeship as a compositor in the office of william lloyd garrison at boston founded the irish world in eighteen seventy this newspaper gave powerful aid to the land league a special issue of one million six hundred fifty thousand copies of the irish world was printed on january eleventh eighteen seventy nine for circulation in ireland and money to the amount of six hundred thousand dollars altogether 
was sent by ford to the headquarters of the agitation in dublin a journalist of a totally different kind was edwin lawrence godkin born in county wicklow the son of a presbyterian clergyman godkin in eighteen sixty five established the nation in new york as an organ of independent thought and for thirty-five years he filled a unique position standing aside from all parties sects and bodies and yet permeating them all with his sane and restraining philosophy in canada thomas d'arcy mcgee won fame as a journalist on the new era before he became even more distinguished as a parliamentarian when the history of australian journalism is written it will contain two outstanding irish names daniel henry denaghy who died in eighteen sixty five was called by bulwer lytton the australian macaulay on account of his brilliant writings as critic and reviewer in the press of victoria gerald henry supple another dublin man is also remembered for his contributions to the age and the Argus of melbourne in india one of the first if not the first english newspapers was founded by a limerick man named charles johnstone who had previously attained fame as the author of chrysal or the adventures of a guinea and who died at calcutta about eighteen hundred stirring memories of battle and adventure leaped to mind at the names of those renowned war correspondents william howard russell edmund o'donovan and james j o'kelly russell a dublin man was the first newspaper representative to accompany an army into the field he saw all the mighty engagements of the crimea alma balaclava inkerman sebastopol not from a distance of sixty or eighty miles which is the nearest that correspondents are now allowed to approach the front but at the closest quarters riding through the lines on his mule and seeing the engagements vividly so that he was able to describe them in moving detail for the readers of the times o'donovan son of dr john o'donovan the distinguished irish scholar and archaeologist was in the service of the london daily news that dashing campaigner as his famous book the merv oasis shows him to have been perished with hicks pasha's army in the sudan in november eighteen eighty three at the same time james o'kelly also of the daily news was lost in the desert trying to join the forces of the victorious sudanese under the mahdi ten years before that he had accomplished for the new york herald the equally daring and hazardous feat of joining the cuban rebels in revolt against spain he escaped the perils of the mambi land and the sudan and survived to serve ireland for many years as a nationalist member in the british parliament john augustus o'shea better known perhaps as the irish bohemian also deserves remembrance for his quarter of a century's work as special correspondent in europe including paris during the siege for the london standard indeed no matter to what side of journalism we turn we find irishmen filling the foremost and the highest places john thaddeus delane under whose editorship the times became for a time the most influential newspaper in the world was of irish parentage the first editor of the illustrated london news eighteen forty two one of the pioneers in the elucidation of news by means of pictures was an irishman frederick bailey among the projectors of punch and one of its earliest contributors was a king's county man joseph sterling coyne the founder of the liverpool daily post eighteen fifty five the first penny daily paper in great britain was michael joseph witty a wexford man his son edward m witty was the originator of that interesting feature of english and irish journalism the sketch of personalities and proceedings in parliament of the editors of the athenaeum for many years the leading english organ of literary criticism 
one of the most famous was dr john doran who was of irish parentage dodd is a familiar household word in the british parliament it is the name of the recognized guide to the careers and political opinions of lords and commons its founder was an irishman charles roger dodd who for twenty-three years was a parliamentary reporter for the times and what name sheds a brighter light on the annals of british journalism for intellectual and imaginative force than that of justin mccarthy novelist and historian as well as newspaper writer at home in ireland the name of gray is inseparably associated with the freeman's journal under the direction of dr john gray this newspaper became in the sixties and seventies the most powerful organ of public opinion in ireland and in the eighties it was raised still higher in ability and influence by his son and successor edmund dwyer gray in the south of ireland the most influential daily newspaper is the cork examiner which was founded in eighteen forty one by john francis mcguire who wrote in eighteen sixty eight the irish in america it is doubtful whether any country ever produced a more militant and able political journal than was united ireland in the stormy years during which it was edited by william o'brien as the organ of the land league the irish mood is gregarious expansive glowing and eager to keep an in intimate touch with the movements and affairs of humanity that i think is the secret of its success in journalism references madden irish periodical literature eighteen sixty seven andrews english journalism eighteen fifty five north newspaper and periodical press of the united states eighteen eighty four macdonald the reporter's gallery nineteen thirteen End of section 35. Section 36 of The Glories of Ireland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Glories of Ireland. Edited by Joseph Dunn and P.J. Lennox. Section 36. The Irish Literary Revival by Horatio S. Kranz, Ph.D. In the closing decade of the 19th century and in the opening years of the 20th, no literary movement has awakened a livelier interest than the Irish literary revival, a movement which, by its singleness and solidarity of purpose, stood alone in a time of confused literary aims and tendencies. Movements, like individuals, have their ancestry, and that of the Irish literary revival is easily traced. It descends from Callanan and Walsh, and from the writers of 48. It is to this descent that the lines in William Butler Yeats's To Ireland in Coming Times allude. Know that I would accounted be true brother of that company who sang to sweeten Ireland's wrong, ballad and story, ran and song. With the passing of the mid-nineteenth century writers, the old movement waned, and in the field of Irish letters there was, in the phrase of a famous bull, nothing stirring but stagnation. A witty critic of the period, commenting upon this unhappy state of affairs, declared that, though the love of learning in Ireland might still be, as the saying went, indestructible, it was certainly imperceptible. But after the fall of Parnell, a new spirit was stirring. Politics no longer absorbed the whole energy of the nation. Groups of men inspired with a love of the arts sprang up here and there. In 1890, Yeats proved himself a real prophet when he wrote, quote, A true literary consciousness, national to the center, seems gradually to be forming out of all this disguising and prettifying, this penumbra of half-culture. We are preparing, likely enough, for a new Irish literary movement like that of 48, that will show itself in the first lull in politics. End quote. Responsive to the need of the young writers associated with Yeats, the National Literary Society was founded in Dublin in 1892, and a year later, London Irishmen, among them men already distinguished in letters, founded in the English metropolis 
the Irish Literary Society. From the presses in Dublin, in London, and in New York as well, books began to appear in rapid succession. Slender volumes of verse, novels, short stories, essays, plays, translations, and remakings of Irish myths and legends, all inspired by, and closely related to, the past or the present of Ireland, voicing an essentially national spirit and presenting the noblest traits of Irish life and character. Not content with the organization of two literary societies, Yeats, with courage and relentless tenacity, cast about to realize his long-cherished dream of a theater that should embody the ideals of the revival. In Lady Gregory and in Edward Martin, an Irishman of large means, who with both pen and purse lent a willing hand, he found two ardent laborers for his vineyard. George Moore, who in the event proved a fish out of water in Ireland, Yeats and Martin contrived to lure from his London lodgings and his cosmopolitan ways, and to enlist in the theatrical enterprise. The practical knowledge of the stage, which this gifted enfant terrible of literature contributed, was doubtless of great value in the early days of the dramatic adventure, though Moore's frank thoughts, frank speech, and mordant irony brought an element of discord into Dublin literary circles, which may well have left Yeats and his associates with a feeling that they had paid too dear for a piper to whose tunes they refused to dance. Be that as it may, in 1899 Yeats's dream was measurably realized, and the Irish Literary Theatre established, to be succeeded a little later by the Irish National Theatre Society. Enough, however, of the dramatic aspect of the revival, which receives separate treatment elsewhere in these pages, as does also the dramatic work of certain of the authors considered here. From what has been already said, it should be plain that in the last decade of the last century, the ranks of the Irish literary revivalists filled rapidly, and that the movement was really underway. The Renaissance spirit took various forms. To one group of poets, the humor, pathos, and tragedy of peasant life deeply appealed, and found expression in a poetry distinctively and unmistakably national, from which a kind of pleasure could be drawn unlike anything else in other literatures. In this group, Alfred Percival Graves and Moira O'Neill cannot pass unmentioned. Who would ask anything racier in its kind than the former's Father O'Flynn? A priest we can offer a charm and variety, far renowned for learning and piety, still at advance you without impropriety, Father O'Flynn is the flower of them all. Here's a health to you, Father O'Flynn, slancha and slancha and slancha again, powerfulest preacher, and tenderest teacher, and kindliest creature, in old Donegal. Or was the homing instinct, the homesick longing for the old sod, ever more truly rendered than in Moira O'Neill's Song of the Irish Labourer in England? Over here in England I'm helping with the hay, and I wish I was in Ireland the love long day, weary on the English, and sorry take the wheat. Oh, Corrymeela and the blue sky over it. Do you mind me now, the song at night is martial hard to raise. The girls are heavy going here, the boys are ill to plays. When once I'm out of this working hive, tis I'll be back again. Ay, Corrymeela, in the same soft rain. Here, too, should be named Jane Barlow, whose poems and stories are faithful imaginative transcripts of the face of nature and the hearts of men as she knew them in Connemara. Finally, there is William Butler Yeats, who, on the whole, is the representative man of the revival. Except in the translator's sphere, his writings have given him a place in almost all the activities of this movement. As a lyric poet, he has expressed the moods of peasant and patriot, of mystic, symbolist, and quietist, and it is safe to say that in lyric poetry no one of his generation writing in English is his superior. We cannot resist the pleasure of quoting here from his Innis Free, which won the praise of Robert Louis Stevenson, and which, if not the high mark of Yeats's achievement, is still a flawless thing in its way. I will arise and go now, and go to Innis Free, and a small cabin built there, of clay and wattles made. Nine bean rolls will I have there, a hay for the honey bee, and live alone in the bee lloyd glade, and I shall have some peace there for peace comes dropping slow, dropping from the vase of the morning to where the cricket sings. There midnight's all a glimmer, and noon a purple glow, 
an evening full of the linnet's wings. In this place, and for convenience sake, it may be permitted to speak of aspects of Yeats's work other than that by virtue of which he is to be classed with the group we have just considered. In his narrative poem, The Wanderings of Oshin, as well as in his plays and lyrics, he is the best of those, among whom we may mention, by the way, Dr. John Todd Hunter, Nora Hopper, this is W. H. Chesson, and William Larminy, who have revealed to our day the strange beauty of the ancient creations of the Gaelic imagination. In prose, he has written short stories, a novelette, John Sherman and Doya, and essays that reveal a subtle critical insight and a style of beautiful finish and grace suggestive of the style of Shelley's defense of poetry. Yeats's plays constitute a considerable and an important part of his work, but these must be reserved for treatment elsewhere in this book. In prefaces to anthologies of prose and verse of his editing, in the pages of reviews and elsewhere, he appears as the chief apologist of the aims of the literary revival, and in particular of the methods of the dramatists of the revival. Whatever he has touched, he has lifted into the realm of poetry, and this is in large measure true of his prose, which proceeds from the poet's point of view and breathes the poetic spirit. A man of rare versatility, a finished artist with a scrupulous artistic conscience, he has done work of high and sustained quality, and is certain to exert a good and lasting influence upon the literature of his country. In a literary movement in the Isle of Saints, we look naturally for religious poetry, and we do not look in vain. This poetry, chiefly Catholic, has a quality of its own as distinctive as that of the writers of the group we have just left. Now it voices a naive, devoted simplicity of Christian faith, now it attains to a high and keen spirituality, now it is mystic and pagan. Among the religious poets, Lionel Johnson easily stands first, perhaps the Irish poet of firmest fibre and most resonant voice of his generation. A note of high courage and of spiritual triumph rings through his verse, even from the shadow of the wings of the dark angel that gives a title to one of the saddest of his poems. Often he strikes a note of genuine religious ecstasy and exaltation, rarely heard in English, as in Te Martyrum Candidatus. Ah, see the fair chivalry come, the companions of Christ, white horsemen who ride on white horses, the knights of God, they for their lord and their lover who sacrificed all save the pleasure of treading where he first trod. These through the darkness of death, the dominion of night, swept, and they woke in white places at morning tide. They saw with their eyes, and sang for the joy of the sight. They saw with their eyes, the eyes of the crucified. Among the men of the revival, no personality is stronger or more attractive than that of G. W. Russell. A.E., as he is always called, who may be regarded as the hero of George Moore's Hail and Farewell, and who alone in that gallery of wonderful pen portraits looks forth with complete amiability. He is a pantheist, a mystic, and a visionary, with what would seem a literal and living faith in many gods, though strongly prepossessed in favor of the ancient divinities of the Gael, now long since in exile. Impressive and striking by a certain spiritual integrity, so to say, A.E. unites gifts and faculties seldom combined. He is a poet of rare subtlety, a painter in whose genius so good a judge as George Moore believed, and a most practical man of affairs, who, as assistant to Sir Horace Plunkett, held up the latter's hands in his labors on behalf of cooperative dairies and the like. His poems have their roots in a pantheism, which half reveals the secrets of an indwelling spirit, speaking alike, quote, from the dumb brown lips of earth, end quote, and from the passions of the heart of man. Of novelists, both men and women, the Irish revival can, in the words of Father O'Flynn, offer a charming variety, and among their novels and short stories are some books of high quality, and not a few, in a high degree, interesting and entertaining. To Standish O'Grady we turn for tales, with a kind of bardic afflatus about them, of the hero age of legendary Ireland, tales which drew attention to the romantic Celtic past of myth and saga, and must have been an inspiration to more than one writer of the younger generation. In contrast to the broad epic sweep and remote romantic backgrounds of O'Grady are the stories of Jane Barlow, 
whose genre pictures of peasant life in the west of Ireland, like her poems mentioned above, show how sympathetically she understands the ways of thinking, feeling, and acting of her humble compatriots. A like minute and faithful knowledge is evident in the work of two storytellers of the North, Seamus McManus and Sean Bullock. The former's outlook is humorous and pathetic. He tells fairy and folk tales well, and is a past master of the dialect and idiom that combine to give his old wives' yarns an honest smack of the soil. Let him who doubts it read Through the Turf Smoke or Donegal Fairy Stories. If Sean Bullock walks the same fields as Seamus McManus, he does so with a different air and with a more definite purpose. Sometimes he turns to the squireens, small farmers, or small country gentry, and lays bare the hardness and narrowness that are part of their life. Or again, in pictures whose sadness and gloom are lightened, to be sure, with humor or warmed with love, he studies the necessitous life of the poor. The Squireen, the Barrys, and Irish Pastorals are some of his representative books. In the novel, as in poetry, the ladies have worked side by side with their literary brethren. Miss Hermione Templeton, in her Darby O'Gill and elsewhere, has written pleasantly and gracefully of the fairies. In a very different vein are the novels of the collaborators Miss Somerville and Martin Ross, Miss Violet Martin, over which English and American readers have laughed as heartily as their own fellow countrymen. The Experiences of an Irish R.M. remains perhaps their best book. The work of these ladies, be it said by the way, is in the line of descent from that group of older Irish novelists who wrote in the spirit of the devil-may-care gentry, the novelists from Maxwell to Lover and Lever, who were ever questing divilment and devarsion, and who in their moods of boisterous fun forgot the real Irishman and presented in his place a caricature him of the Celtic screech and the exhilarating whack of the shillelagh, the famous stage Irishman who has made occasional appearances in English literature from the time of Shakespeare's Henry V on through the works of Fielding and the plays of Sheridan to the present moment of writing. Of a very different stripe from the works of the collaborating ladies just mentioned are the novels of the recently deceased Canon Sheehan, notable among them Luke Del Meage and My New Curate, rambling, diffuse, and a trifle provincial from the artistic standpoint, but interesting as studies of manners, and for the pictures they afford of the priesthood of modern Ireland in the pleasantest light. If the stories of Miss Somerville and Martin Ross are related to the comic stories of the old novelists of the gentry, those of Canon Sheehan must be associated with the work of the older novelists who wrote more or less in the spirit of the peasantry, that is, with Gerald Griffin, the Bannim brothers, and William Carlton, less famous than he deserves to be by his traits and stories and a long line of novels and tales. No survey of Irish novelists, however brief, can afford to forget the Reverend James Owen Hannay, George A. Birmingham, canon of St. Patrick's Cathedral, Dublin, whose work is as distinctively Protestant in its point of view as Father Sheehan's is Catholic. His more substantial novels are a careful transcript of the actualities of Irish life today, and in them one meets, incognito but easily recognisable, many Irishmen now prominent in literature or politics in Ireland. Of his numerous books may be mentioned The Seething Pot, Hyacinth, and Northern Iron. Finally, there is George Moore, whose enlistment in the revival was responsible for the novel The Lake and the short stories of The Unfilled Field, and for a largely autobiographic and entirely indiscreet trilogy, entitled Hail and Farewell, the separate volumes appearing as Ave, Save, Vale, and the last of them as late as 1914. George Moore's anti-Catholic bias is strong, but his is the pen of an accomplished artist. He is the storyteller's beguiling gift, and he bristles with ideas which his books cleverly embody, and to which the dramatic moments of his novels give point and relief. Not the least important work of the Irish literary revival has been done by translators, who have put into English the old Gaelic romances and the folklore still current among the little remnant of Irish-speaking country folk. Dr. Douglas Hyde is in the forefront of this group. He it was who organized the Gaelic League, a band of enthusiasts zealous for the revival of the Irish language, both as a spoken tongue and as the medium for a national literature, 
and eager also to breed up a race of Celtic scholars. The lyrics in his Love Songs of Connacht are full of grace, tenderness, and fire, and indicate the kind of gems which he and his fellow laborers have added to the treasury of poetry in English. But it is Lady Gregory, especially in her Cuchulain of Murthevne and Gods and Fighting Men, who more than any other has found a way to stir the blood of readers of today by the romantic hero tales of Ireland. From the racy idiom of the dwellers on or about her own estate in Galway, she happily framed a style that gave her narratives freshness, novelty, and a flavor of the soil. Upon the work of scholars she drew heavily in making her own renderings, but she has justified all borrowings by breathing into her books the breath and the warmth of life, and her adaptation to epic purposes of the dialect of those who still retain the expiring habit of thinking in Gaelic was a real literary achievement. She has, indeed, in sins of commission and of omission, taken liberties with the old legends, but this may render them not less, and perhaps more, delightful to the general reader, however just complaints may be from the standpoint of the scholar. Even so brief a sketch as this may suffice to bring home to those not already aware of it a realization of the delights to be drawn from the creations of a living literary movement, which is perhaps the most notable of its generation, and which has gathered together a remarkable group of poets, novelists, and dramatists, who, as men and women, are a most interesting company, a fact to which even George Moore's Hail and Farewell, with its quick eye for defects and foibles, and its ironic wit, bears abundant testimony. References Brooke and Rolston, Treasury of Irish Poetry, New York and London, 1900. Crans, William Butler Yeats and the Irish Literary Revival, New York and London, 1904. Yeats, Ideas of Good and Evil, London, 1903. Moore, Hail and Farewell, three volumes, London and New York, 1912 to 1914. Lady Gregory, our Irish Theatre, New York and London, 1913. Vegan, Irish Plays and Playwrights, New York, 1913. Yeats, Introduction to Fairy and Folk Tales of the Irish Peasantry, London, 1889. Representative Irish Tales, London, 1890. Book of Irish Verse, London, 1895. There is much of interest, though chiefly as regards the drama, in the reviews Beltane, London and Dublin, 1899 to 1900, and Samhain, London and Dublin, 1901 to 1903. End of section 36. Recording by Owen Cook in Potawatomi, Ceded Land. Section 37 of The Glories of Ireland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Glories of Ireland, edited by Joseph Dunn and P.J. Lennox. Section 37, Irish Writers of English, by P.J. Lennox, B.A. Litt D. The Gaelic literature of Ireland is not only of wonderful volume and priceless worth, but is also of great antiquity, whereas the English literature of Ireland, while also of considerable extent and high value, is of comparatively modern origin. The explanation of this fact is that for more than six centuries after the Anglo-Norman invasion of 1169, the Irish language continued to be both the spoken and, with Latin, the written organ of the great mass of the Irish people and that for nearly the whole of that period, those English settlers who did not become, as the well-known phrase has it, more Irish than the Irish themselves, by adopting the native language, customs, and sentiments, were kept too busy in holding, defending, and extending their territory to devote themselves to literary pursuits. Hence we need not wonder if, leaving out of account merely technical works like Lionel Power's Treatise on Music, written in 1395, we find that the English literature of Ireland takes its comparatively humble origin late in the 16th century. For more than two centuries thereafter, owing to the fact that the native Irish, because they were Catholics, were debarred by law from an education, the writing of English remained almost exclusively in the hands of members or descendants of the Anglo-Irish colony, who, with scarcely an exception, were Protestants and had as their principal Irish seat of learning 
the then essentially Protestant institution, Trinity College Dublin. Alien in race and creed though these writers mainly were, they have nevertheless spread a halo of glory around their adopted country, and have won the admiration, and often the affection, of Irishmen of every shade of religious and political belief. For example, there is no Irishman who is not proud of Molyneux and Swift, of Goldsmith and Burke, of Grattan and Sheridan. From the 19th century onward, Irish Catholics have taken their full share in the production of English literature. Here, however, it will be necessary to consider the writers of none but the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries, as in other pages of this volume considerable attention has been given to those of later date. 1. 16th century. Richard Stanihurst, 1547-1618, born in Dublin but educated at Oxford, is the first representative of the 16th century with whom we are called upon to deal. He belonged to a family long settled in or near Dublin, and of some note in municipal annals. Under the direction of the Jesuit martyr Edmund Campion, Stanahurst wrote a description, as well as a portion of the history, of Ireland for Hollinshead's Chronicles, published in 1577. He also translated, 1582, the first four books of Virgil his Aeneas into quantitative hexameters, on the unsound pedantic principles which Gabriel Harvey was at that time trying so hard to establish in English prosody. But the experiment, which turned out so badly in the master's hands, fared even worse in those of the disciple, and Stanhurst's lines will always stand as a noted specimen of inept translation and ridiculous versification. Equally inartistic was his version of some of the psalms in the same meter. In Latin, he wrote a profound commentary on Porphyry, the Neoplatonic mystic. Stanahurst, who was uncle to James Usher, the celebrated Protestant Archbishop of Armagh, was himself a convert to Catholicity, and on the death of his second wife became a priest and wrote in Latin some edifying books of devotion. Two of his sons joined the Jesuit order. He died at Brussels in 1618. Stanahurst viewed Ireland entirely from the English standpoint, and in his description and history is, consciously or unconsciously, greatly biased against the native race. If we may take it as certain that modern investigation is correct in asserting that Thomas Campion was a native of Dublin, a notable addition will have been made to the ranks of Irish-born writers of English at this period. Thomas Campion, 1567 to 1620, wherever born, spent most of his life in London. He was a versatile genius, for after studying law, he took up medicine, and although practicing as a physician, he yet found time to write four masks and many lyrics, and to compose a goodly quantity of music. Some of his songs appeared as early as 1591. Among his works is a treatise entitled Observations in the Art of English Poesy, 1602, in which, strange to say, he, a born lyrist, advocated unrhymed verse and quantitative measures, but fortunately his practice did not usually square with his theory. His masks were written for occasions, such as the marriage of Lord Hayes, 1607, the nuptials of Princess Elizabeth and the Elector Palatine, 1613, and the ill-starred wedding of Somerset and the quondam Countess of Essex in the same year. In these masks are embedded some of his best songs. Others of his lyrics appeared in several books of airs between 1601 and 1670. Many of them were written to music, sometimes music of his composing. Such dainty things as Now hath Flora robbed her bowers, and Hark all ye ladies that do sleep, possess the charms of freshness and spontaneity, and his devotional poetry, especially Awake, Awake, Thou Heavy Sprite, and Never Weather-Beaten Sail, More Willing Bent to Shore, makes almost as wide an appeal. 2. 17th Century Passing by with regret the illustrious 17th century names of Philip O'Sullivan Bear, Sir James Ware, Luke Wadding, Hugh Ward, John Colgan, and John Lynch, because their bearers wrote in Latin, and those of the Four Masters and Geoffrey Keating, because they wrote in Irish, we are first brought to a pause in the 17th century by the imposing figure of him whom, in a later day, Johnson justly called the, quote, great luminary of the Irish Protestant Church, end quote, none other than the Archbishop of Armagh and Primate of Ireland, James Usher himself. 
James Usher, 1581 to 1656, born in Dublin and among the earliest students of the newly founded Trinity College, was in intellect and scholarship one of the greatest men that Ireland has ever produced. Selden describes him as learned to a miracle, ad miraculum doctus, and Canon Dalton, in his History of Ireland, says of him that, quote, he was not unworthy to rank even with Dunce Scotus, and when he died he left in his own church neither an equal nor a second, end quote. Declining the high office of Provost of Trinity, Usher was made Bishop of Meath, and was afterwards promoted to the Primatial See. His fine intellect was unfortunately marred by narrow religious views, and in many ways he displayed his animus against those of his countrymen who did not see eye to eye with him in matters of faith and doctrine. For example, it was he who in 1626 drew up the Irish Protestant bishop's protest against toleration for Catholics, therein showing a bigotry which consorted badly with his reputation as a scholar. On account of his well-known attitude towards Catholicism, he was naturally unpopular with those who professed the ancient creed, and hence, when the rebellion of 1641 broke out, much of his property was destroyed by the enraged insurgents. His person escaped violence, for he happened to be in England at the time, engaged in the vain task of trying to effect an accommodation between Charles I and the English Parliament. He never returned to his see, and died in London. Usher's collected works fill seventeen stately volumes— his magnum opus is undoubtedly the Annales Veteris et Novi Testamenti. It is written in Latin, and is a chronological compendium of the history of the world from the creation to the dispersion of the Jews under Vespasian. Published at Leiden, London, Paris, and Oxford, it gained for its author a European fame. His books written in English deal mostly with theological or controversial subjects, and while they display wide reading, great acumen, and keen powers of argumentation, they yet do not do full justice to his genius. Those which he published in Dublin are A Discourse of the Religion Anciently Professed by the Irish and British, 1622, in which he tried to show that the ritual and discipline of the Church, as originally established in the British Isles, were in agreement with the Church of England, and opposed to the Catholic Church on the matters in dispute between them, an answer to a challenge made by a Jesuit in Ireland, 1624, in which his aim was to disprove the contention set forth earlier in the same year by a Jesuit that uniformity of doctrine had always been maintained by the Catholic Church, and Emmanuel, or the mystery of the Incarnation. He published in England The Original of Bishops, A Body of Divinity, The Principles of Christian Religion, and other works. So great was Usher's reputation that when he died, Cromwell relaxed in his favor one of the strictest laws of the Puritans, and allowed him to be buried with the full service of the Church of England, and with great pomp, in Westminster Abbey. Among Usher's other claims to distinction, it should be noted that it was he who, in 1621, discovered the celebrated Book of Kells, which had long been lost. This marvel of the illuminator's art passed, with the remainder of his collection of books and manuscripts, to Trinity College Dublin in 1661, and to this day it remains one of the most treasured possessions of the noble library of that institution. Sir John Denham, 1615 to 1669, a Dublin man by birth, took an active part on the side of Charles I against the Parliament during the Civil War and subsequently was conspicuous in the intrigues that led to the restoration of Charles II. In his own day, he had a great reputation as a poet. His tragedy, The Sophie, and his translation of the Psalms are now forgotten, but he is still well remembered for one piece, Cooper's Hill, in which occur the well-known lines addressed to the River Thames. Oh, could I flow like thee, and make thy stream my great example, as it is my theme, though deep, yet clear. Though gentle, yet not dull, strong without rage, without o'erflowing, full. Another Dublin-born man was Wentworth Dillon, Earl of Roscommon, 1633 to 1684. He had the good fortune to win encomiums both from Dryden and from Pope. One of his merits, as pointed out by the latter, is that, In all Charles's days, Roscommon only boasts unspotted bays. He translated from Virgil, Lucan, Horace, and Guarini, wrote prologues, epilogues, and other occasional verses, 
but is now principally remembered for his poetical essay on translated verse, 1681, in which he develops principles previously laid down by Cowley and Denham. To his credit, be it said, he condemns indecency, both as want of sense and as bad taste. He was honored with a funeral in Westminster Abbey. Johnson records that, at the moment of his death, Roscommon uttered with great energy and devotion the following two lines from his own translation of the Dies Irae. My God, my Father, and my Friend, do not forsake me in my end. Robert Boyle, 1627 to 1691, one of the great founders of the Royal Society, 1662, was the son of the great Earl of Cork, and was born at Lismore, County Waterford. He takes rank among the principal experimental philosophers of his age, and he certainly rendered valuable services to the advancement of science. Most of his writings, which are very voluminous, are naturally of a technical character, and therefore do not belong to literature. But his occasional reflections on several subjects, 1665, a strange mixture of triviality and seriousness, was germinal in this sense that it led to two celebrated jeux d'esprit, namely Butler's occasional reflection on Dr. Charlton's feeling a dog's pulse at Gresham College, and Swift's pious meditation upon a broomstick, in the style of the Honourable Mr. Boyle. Indeed, one of Boyle's reflections, that upon the eating of oysters, is reputed to have rendered a still more signal service to literature, for in its two concluding paragraphs is contained the idea which, under the transforming hand of the master satirist, eventually took the world by storm when it appeared, fully developed, as Gulliver's Travels. His brother, Roger Boyle, 1621 to 1679, who figures largely as a soldier and statesman in Irish and English history under his title of Lord Brawhill, was an alumnus of Trinity College, Dublin. During the Civil War, he was a royalist until the death of Charles I, when he changed sides and aided Cromwell materially in his Irish campaign. When the Lord Protector died, Brahill made another right-about face, and, crossing to his native country, worked so energetically and successfully that he made Ireland solid for the restoration of Charles II. For this service, he was rewarded by being created Earl of Orrery. He was the author of six tragedies and two comedies, some of which, when produced, proved gratifyingly popular. He is noted for having been the first to write tragedy in rhyme, thereby setting an example that was followed with avidity, for a time, by Dryden and others. He also wrote poems, a romance called Parthenissa, 1654, and a treatise on the art of war, 1677. From whatever point of view considered, Lord Orrery was a remarkable member of a remarkable family. His son, John Boyle, Earl of Cork and Orrery, 1707 to 1762, in virtue of his translation of Pliny's letters, his remarks on the life and writings of Swift, and his letters from Italy, has some claims to recognition in the field of literature. Charles Leslie, 1650 to 1722, a Dubliner by birth, was son of that John Leslie, Bishop of Raffaux and Clauter, who lived through a whole century, from 1571 to 1671, and who was 79 years of age when Charles, his sixth son, was born. Educated first at Enniskillen, and afterwards at Trinity College, Dublin, Charles Leslie studied law in London, but eventually abandoned that profession and entered the ministry. He was of a disputatious character, and in particular went to great lengths in opposing the pro-Catholic activities of James II. Nevertheless, when the revolution of 1688 came, he took the side of the deposed monarch, and loyally adhered to his Jacobite principles for the remainder of his life. He eventually joined the old pretender on the continent, and endeavoured to convert him to Protestantism. But failing therein, he returned to Ireland, where he died at Glasloch in County Monaghan. Many years of Leslie's life were devoted to disputes with Catholics, Quakers, Socinians, and Deists, and the seven volumes which his writings fill prove that he was an extremely able controversialist. His best-known work is the famous treatise A Short and Easy Method with the Deists, published in 1698. The Irish note, tone, or temper is not conspicuous in any of the writings so far named, unless when it is conspicuous by its absence. 
but it appears plainly for the first time in Molyneux's Case of Ireland being bound by laws made in England, stated, 1698. William Molyneux has always ranked as an Irish patriot. His was one of the spirits invoked by Grattan in his great speech, 1782, on the occasion on which he carried his celebrated Declaration of Independence in the Irish Parliament. When the English Act of 1698, which was meant to destroy, and did destroy, the Irish woolen industry came before the Irish House of Commons for ratification, Molyneux's was the only voice raised against its adoption. His protest was followed by the publication of his case stated, which is a classic on the general relations between Ireland and England, and contained arguments so irrefutable that it drove the English Parliament to fury, and was by that body ordered to be burned by the common hangman. It is a remarkable coincidence that Molyneux opens his argument by laying down, in almost identical words, the principles which stand at the beginning of the American Declaration of Independence. John Toland, 1669-1722, was born near Redcastle in County Derry, and was at first a Catholic, but subsequently became a freethinker. His Christianity Not Mysterious, 1696, marks an epoch in religious disputes, for it started the deistical controversy, which was so distinctive a feature of the first half of the 18th century. It shared a similar fate to that of the case stated, though on very different grounds, and was ordered by the Irish Parliament to be burned by the hangman. Toland wrote many other books, among which are Amintor, 1699, Nazarenus, 1702, Pantheisticon, History of the Druids, and Hypatia. All his books show versatility and wide reading, and are characterized by a pointed, vigorous, and aggressive style. George Farquhar, 1678-1707, a dairyman, and Thomas Southern, 1660-1746, born near Dublin, were distinguished playwrights who began their respective careers in the 17th century. Farquhar left Trinity College Dublin as an undergraduate and became an actor, but owing to his accidental killing of another player, he left the stage and secured a commission in the army. He soon turned his attention to the writing of plays, and was responsible in all for eight comedies. He has left us some characters that are very humorous, and at the same time true to life, such as Scrub the Servant in The Bow's Stratagem, and Sergeant Kite in The Recruiting Officer. His Boniface, the landlord in the former of these two plays, has become the type, as well as the ordinary quasi-facetious nickname, of an innkeeper. He was advancing in his art, for his last comedy, The Bow's Stratagem, 1707, is undoubtedly his best, and had he lived longer, he died before he was thirty, he might have bequeathed to posterity something even more noteworthy. As Lee Hunt says of him, quote, he was becoming gayer and gayer, when death, in the shape of a sore anxiety, called him away as if from a pleasant party, and left the house ringing with his jest. End quote. Southern was also a student of Trinity College, Dublin. At the age of 18, however, he left his alma mater and went to London to study law. This profession he in turn abandoned for the drama. His first play, The Persian Prince of the Loyal Brother, had a remarkable success when performed and secured him an ensign's commission in the army, 1685. Here promotion came to him rapidly, and by 1688 he had risen to captain's rank. The revolution of that year, however, cut off all further hope of advancement, and he once more turned his attention to the writing of plays. His productions, number 10. His tragedies Isabella, or The Fatal Marriage, 1694, and Arunico, 1696, both founded on tales by Mrs. Aphra Bain, are powerful presentations of human suffering. His comedies are amusing but gross. Southern had business ability enough to make playwriting pay, and the amounts he received for his productions fairly staggered his friend Dryden. It is to this faculty that Pope alludes when he says that Southern was one whom heaven sent down to raise the price of prologues and of plays. He was apparently of amiable and estimable character, for he secured and retained the friendship not only of Dryden, a comparatively easy matter, but also that of Pope, a much more difficult task. Known as the poet's nester, 
Southern spent his declining years in peaceful retirement and in the enjoyment of the fortune which he had amassed by his pen. Nahum Tate, 1652 to 1715, a Dubliner by birth, and Nicholas Brady, 1659 to 1726, a Bandon man, have secured a certain sort of twin immortality by their authorized metrical version of the Psalms, 1696, which gradually took the place of the older rendering by Sternhold and Hopkins. Tate became poet laureate in 1690 in succession to Shadwell, and was appointed historiographer royal in 1702. He wrote the bulk of the second part of Absalom and Achitophel with a wonderfully close imitation of Dryden's manner, besides several dramatic pieces and poems. Between Tate, Shadwell, Usedon, and Pye lies the unenviable distinction of being the worst of the laureates of England. Brady was a clergyman who, after the pleasant fashion of that day, was a pluralist on a small scale, for he had the living of Richmond for thirty years from 1696, and while holding that, held also in succession the livings of Stratford-on-Avon and Clapham. He added further to his income, and doubtless to his anxieties, by keeping a school at Richmond. He wrote a tragedy entitled The Rape, A History of the Goths and Vandals, a translation of the Aeneid into blank verse, and an ode for St. Cecilia's Day, but unless for his share in the version of the Psalms, his literary reputation is well-nigh as dead as the dodo. Ireland somewhat doubtfully claims to have given birth to Mrs. Susanna Saint-Livre, circa 1667 to 1723, who, after a rather wild youth, set down to literary pursuits and domestic contentment, when in 1706 she married Queen Anne's head cook, Joseph Saint-Livre, with whom she lived happily ever after. Her first play, The Provoked Husband, a tragedy, was produced in 1700, and then she went on the stage as an actress. She wrote in all 19 dramatic pieces, some of which had the honor of being translated into French and German. Her most original play was A Bold Stroke for a Wife, 1717. End of section 37. Recording by Owen Cook in Potawatomi, Ceded Land. Section 38 of The Glories of Ireland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. The Glories of Ireland, edited by Joseph Dunn and P. J. Lennox. Irish Writers of English, Part 2, by P. J. Lennox, B. A. Lit. D. 18th Century. We have now fairly crossed the border of the 18th century, and as we met Usher early in the 17th, so we are here confronted with the colossal intellect and impressive personality of Swift, one of the greatest, most peculiar, and most original geniuses to be found in the whole domain of English literature. Jonathan Swift, 1667 to 1745, born in Dublin, was educated at Trinity College, where he succeeded in graduating only by special favor. After some years spent in the household of Sir William Temple in England, he entered the ministry of the Irish Church. During the early years of the century he spent much time in London and took an active part in bringing about that political revolution which seated the Tories firmly in power during the last four years of the reign of Queen Anne. His services in that connection on the Examiner newspaper were so great that it would be difficult to dispute the assertion, which has been made, that he was one of the mightiest journalists that ever wielded a pen. He also stood loyally by his party in his great pamphlets, The Conduct of the Allies, 1711, The Barrier Treaty, 1712, and The Public Spirit of the Whigs, 1714. When the time came for his reward, he received not, as he had hoped, an English bishopric, but the deanery of St. Patrick's in Dublin. On resuming his residence in Ireland, he was at first very unpopular, but his patriotic spirit, as shown in the Drapier Letters, 1723 to 1724, written in connection with a coinage scheme known as Wood's Halfpence, not only caused the withdrawal of the obnoxious project, but also made Swift the idol of all classes of his countrymen. 
in many others of his writings he showed that pro-irish leaning which caused grattan to invoke his spirit along with that of molno on the occasion already referred to nothing more mordant than the irony contained in his modest proposal has ever been penned in his plea for native manufactures he struck a keynote that has vibrated down the ages when he advised irishmen to burn everything english except coal swift's greater works are the battle of the books his contribution to the controversy concerning the relative merits of the ancients and the moderns the tale of a tub in which he attacked the three leading forms of christianity and above all gulliver's travels in this last work he let loose the full flood of his merciless satire and lashed the folly and vices of mankind in the most unsparing way he also wrote verses which are highly characteristic and some of them not without considerable merit his life was unhappy and for the last five years of it he was to all intents and purposes insane his relations with stella hester johnson and vanessa esther van roaming have never been quite satisfactorily explained the weight of evidence would seem to show that he was secretly married to stella but that they never lived together as husband and wife many novels and plays have been written round those entanglements he lies buried in his own cathedral st patrick's dublin and beside him lies stella over his tomb there is an epitaph in latin written by himself in which after speaking of the seva indignatio which tore his heart he bids the wayfarer to go and imitate if he can the energetic defender of his native land contemporary with the dean there was another anglo-irishman who fills a large space in the history of english literature and of whom his countrymen are justly proud sir richard steele sixteen seventy two to seventeen twenty nine who was born in dublin and educated at the charterhouse in london and afterwards at oxford started the tatler in 1709 and thereby popularized though he did not exactly originate the periodical essay aided by his friend addison he carried the work to perfection in the spectator 1711 to 1712 and the guardian 1713 since then these essays have enlightened and amused each succeeding generation of the two addison's is the greater name but steele was the more innovating spirit for it is to him and not to addison that the conception and initiation of the plan of the celebrated papers is due steele had had a predecessor in defoe whose review had been in existence since seventeen o four but the more airy graces which characterized the tatler and the spectator gave the lucubrations of isaac bickerstaff and of mr spectator a greater hold on the public than defoe's paper was ever able to establish Steele was responsible for many more periodicals, such as The Englishman, The Lover, The Reader, Town Talk, The Tea Table, Chit Chat, The Plebeian, and The Theater, most of which had a rather ephemeral existence. Among his other services to literature, he helped to purify the stage of some of its grossness, and he became the founder of that sentimental comedy which in the days of the early Georges took the place of the immoral comedy of the Restoration period, when in johnson's famous phrase intrigue was plot obscenity was wit steele's four comedies are the funeral or grief a la mode 1701 the lying lover 1703 the tender husband 1705 and the conscious lovers 1722 although he held various lucrative offices steele was never really prosperous and was frequently in debt like most of the contemporary Englishmen with whom his lot was thrown, he was rather addicted to the bottle. But on the whole, it may fairly be advanced that unnecessary stress has been laid on these aspects of his life by Macaulay, Thackeray, and others. After a checkered career, he died near Carmarthen in Wales on September 1, 1729. Member of a family and bearer of a name destined to secure immense fame in later Irish history, Thomas Parnell, 1679 to 1718, was born in Dublin and educated at Trinity College. Entering the ministry in 1700, he was rapidly promoted to be Archdeacon of Clower, and some years later he was made Rector of Finglas. An accomplished scholar and a delightful companion, he was one of the original members of the famous Scribblerus Club, and wrote or helped to write several of its papers he contributed to the spectator and the guardian and he rendered sterling assistance to pope in the translation of homer 
as will be inferred he spent much of his time in england and on one of his journeys to ireland he died in his thirty-ninth year at chester where he was buried he wrote a great deal of verse songs hymns epistles eclogues translations tales and occasional trifles but three poems a hymn to contentment which is fanciful and melodious a night piece on death in which inquisitorial research seems to have found the first faint dawn of romanticism and the hermit which has not been inaptly styled the apex and chef de of augustan poetry in england constitute his chief claim to present remembrance francis hutcheson sixteen ninety four to seventeen forty six the son of a presbyterian minister was born at Armagh and studied at Glasgow University. He opened in Dublin a private academy which succeeded beyond expectation. The publication of his Inquiry into the Original of Our Ideas of Beauty and Virtue, 1720, and his Essay on the Nature and Conduct of the Passions, 1728, brought him great fame, and in 1729 he was elected to the Professorship of Moral Philosophy in the University of Glasgow. Others of his works are a treatise on logic, and a system of moral philosophy, the latter not published till 1755, nine years after his death. Hutcheson fills a large space in the history of philosophy, both as a metaphysician and as a moralist. He is in some respects a pioneer of the Scotch school and of common-sense philosophy. He greatly developed the doctrine of moral sense, a term first used by the third Earl of Shaftesbury. Indeed, much of his whole moral system may be traced to Shaftesbury, Hutcheson's influence was widely felt. It is plainly perceptible in Hume, Adam Smith, and Reed. He was greater as a speaker even than as a writer, and his lectures evoked much enthusiasm. George Berkeley, 1685 to 1753, Bishop of Cloyne, was born at Dysart Castle near Thomastown County, Kilkenny, and was educated first at Kilkenny School and afterwards at Trinity College, Dublin. Having taken Anglican orders, he visited London, where he wrote nine papers for the Guardian, and was admitted to the companionship and friendship of the leading literary men of the age, Swift, Pope, Addison, Steele, and Arbuthnot. This connection proved of great assistance to him, for Pope not only celebrated him as possessing every virtue under heaven, but also recommended him to the Duke of Grafton, Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, who appointed him his chaplain, and subsequently obtained for him the deanery of Derry. In furtherance of a great scheme for converting the savage Americans to Christianity, Berkeley and some friends, armed with a royal charter, came to this country, landing at Newport in Rhode Island in January 1729. All went well for a while. Berkeley bought a farm and built a house, but when the hard-hearted Prime Minister refused to forward the twenty thousand pounds which had been promised, the project came to an end, and Berkeley returned to London in February 1732. In 1734 he was appointed Bishop of Cloyne, and later refused the See of Clower, though its income was fully double that of his own diocese. In 1752 he resigned his bishopric and settled at Oxford, where he died in 1753. Berkeley's works are very numerous. His Essay Towards a New Theory of Vision, 1709, which was long regarded in the light of a philosophical romance, in reality contains speculations which have been incorporated in modern scientific optics. In his Three Dialogues Between Hylas and Philonius, 1713, he sets forth his famous demonstration of the immateriality of the external world, of the spiritual nature of the soul, and of the all-ruling and direct providence of God. His tenets on immateriality have always been rejected by common-sense philosophers, but it should be remembered that the whole work was written at a time when the English-speaking world was disturbed by the theories of skeptics and deists, whose doctrines the pious divine sought as best he could to confute. In 1732 appeared his Alciferon, or the Minute Philosopher, in which, dialogue-wise, he presents nature from a religious point of view, and in particular gives many pleasing pictures of American scenery and life. These dialogues have frequently been compared to the dialogues of Plato. To Berkeley's credit, be it said that while he ruled in Cloyne, he devoted much thought to the amelioration of conditions in his native land. Many acute suggestions in that direction are found in the Quirist, 1735-1737. 
by some extraordinary ratiocinative process he convinced himself that tar water was a panacea for human ills and in seventeen forty four he set forth his views on that subject in a tract called cirrus and returned to the charge in seventeen fifty two in his further thoughts on tar water whatever may be thought of the value of berkeley's philosophical or practical speculations there is only one opinion of his style it is distinguished by lucidity ease and charm it has the saving grace of humor and it is shot through with imagination taken all in all this eighteenth century bishop is a notable figure in literary annals charles macklin circa sixteen ninety seven to seventeen ninety seven whose real name was mclaughlin was a Westmeath man who took to the stage in early life and remained on the boards with considerable and undiminished reputation for some seventy years, not retiring until 1789 when he was at least ninety-two years old. To him we are indebted for what is now the accepted presentation of the character of Shylock in The Merchant of Venice. He wrote a tragedy and many comedies and farces. Those by which he is now best remembered are the farce Love a la Mode, 1760, and his masterpiece, The Farcical Comedy, The Man of the World, 1764. In Sir Pertinac's Mac Sycophant, Macklin has given us one of the traditional burlesque characters of the English stage. Thomas Armory, 1691-1788, if not born in Ireland, was at least of Irish descent and was educated in Dublin. He is known in literature for two books, the first with the very mixed title of Memoirs Containing the Lives of Several Ladies of Great Britain, A History of Antiquities, Observations on the Christian Religion, was published in 1755, and the second, The Life of John Bungle Esquire, came out in two volumes in 1756 to 1766. It appears to have been the author's aim in both works to give us a hotchpotch in which he discourses de omnibus rebus et quibustam ailis. We have dissertations on the cause of earthquakes and of muscular motion, on the Athanasian Creed, on fluxions, on phlogiston, on the physical cause of the deluge, on Irish literature, on the origin of language, on the evidences for Christianity, and on all other sorts of unrelated topics. Hazlitt thought the soul of Rabelais had passed into armory, while a more recent critic can see in his long-winded discussions not but the light-headed ramblings of delirium. If we try to read John Bunkle consecutively, the result is boredom, but if we open the book at random, we are pretty sure to be interested and even sometimes agreeably entertained. The bizarre figure of Lawrence Stern, 1713 to 1768, next claims our attention. The son of a captain in the British Army, he was born at Clonmel County Tipperary. Of him, almost more than any of the other writers so far dealt with, it may be said that he was Irish only by the accident of birth. His parents were English on both sides, and practically the whole life of their son was spent out of Ireland. He was sent to school at Halifax in Yorkshire, and thence went on to Cambridge University, where he graduated in due season. Taking Anglican orders in 1738, he was immediately appointed to the benefice of Sutton in the Forest, near York, and on his marriage in 1741 with Elizabeth Lumley, he received the additional living of Stillington. He was also given sundry prebendal and other appointments in connection with the chapter of the Archdiocese of York. He spent nearly twenty years in the discharge of his not very onerous duties, and in reading, painting, shooting, and fiddling, without showing the least sign of any literary leanings. Then suddenly, in 1760, he took the world by storm with the first two volumes of Tristram Shandy. He at once became the lion of the hour, was feted and dined to his heart's content, and had his nostrils tickled with the daily incense of praise from his numerous worshippers. He repeated the experiment with equal success in the following year with two more volumes of Tristram, and so at intervals until 1767, when he published the ninth and last volume of this most peculiar story. In 1768 he brought out A Sentimental Journey, and within three weeks he died in his lodgings in London. His other publications include sermons and letters. Tristram Shandy is unique in English literature. It stands sui generis for all time. There is scarcely any consecutive narrative, and what there is is used merely as a peg on which to hang endless digressions. 
but while there are many faults of taste and morals there are also genuine humour and pathos and without walter shandy dr slop the widow wadman yorick uncle toby and corporal trim english literature would certainly be very much the poorer hugh kelly seventeen thirty nine to seventeen seventy seven born in dublin was the son of a publican and himself became a staymaker a trade from which he developed through the successive stages of attorney's clerk newspaper writer theatrical critic and essayist into a novelist and playwright his novel memoirs of a magdalen seventeen sixty seven was translated into french his first comedy a sentimental one entitled false delicacy seventeen sixty eight achieved a remarkable success on the stage and was even a greater success in book form ten thousand copies being sold in a year so that its author was raised from poverty to comparative affluence in addition it gave him a european reputation for it was translated into german french and portuguese strange to say his later comedies a word to the wise a school for wives and the man of reason were practically failures and the same is true of his tragedy clementina kelly ultimately withdrew from stage work and for the last three years of his life practiced as a barrister without however achieving much distinction in his new profession charles coffee death seventeen forty five an irishman was the author of several farces operas ballad operas ballad farces and farcical operas the best known of which was the devil to pay or the wives metamorphosed seventeen thirty one henry brooke seventeen o three to seventeen eighty three a county caven man and the son of a clergyman was educated at trinity college dublin and afterwards studied law in london becoming guardian to his cousin a girl of twelve he put her to school for two years and then secretly married her of his large family of twenty-two children three of whom were born before their mother was eighteen years old but one survived him appointed by lord chesterfield barrack master at mullingar brooke afterwards settled in county kildare it was there that he wrote his celebrated work the fool of quality or the history of the earl of moreland five volumes seventeen sixty six to seventeen seventy which won the commendations of men so widely different as john wesley and charles kingsley it is indeed a remarkable book combining as it does many of the characteristics of stern mackenzie borrow and george meredith it is not very well known nowadays but it will always bear and will well repay perusal brooke also wrote a poem on universal beauty seventeen thirty five and the tragedies gustavus vasa seventeen thirty nine the production of which was forbidden in london but which was afterwards staged in dublin as the patriot and the earl of essex seventeen forty nine which was played both in london and in dublin and has been made famous by the parody of one line in it by samuel johnson another novel juliet grenville or the history of the human heart published in seventeen seventy four was not nearly up to the standard of the fool of quality brooke was a busy literary man he made a translation of part of tasso drafted plans for a history of ireland projected a series of old irish tales wrote one fragment in a style very like that subsequently adopted by macpherson in his ossian and for a while was editor of the freeman's journal in the beginning brooke was violently anti-catholic but as time progressed he became more liberal-minded and advocated the relaxation of the penal laws and a more humane treatment of his catholic fellow countrymen like swift and steel he fell into a state of mental debility for some years before his death his daughter charlotte brooke seventeen forty to seventeen ninety three deserves mention as a pioneer of the irish literary revival for she devoted herself to the saving of the stores of irish literature which in her time were rapidly disappearing one of the fruits of her labors was the relics of irish poetry published in seventeen eighty nine she also wrote emma or the foundling of the wood a novel and belisarius a tragedy charles johnstone circa seventeen nineteen to eighteen hundred a county limerick man was educated in dublin and called to the english bar but owing to deafness was more successful as a chamber counsel than as a pleader emigrating to india in seventeen eighty two he became joint proprietor of a newspaper in calcutta and there he died he wrote several satirical romances such as chrysal or the adventures of a guinea the reverie or a flight to the paradise of fools and the history of arsace prince of betlis of these the first was the best 
Samuel Johnson, who read it in manuscript, advised its publication, and his opinion was vindicated, for it proved a huge success. Sir Walter Scott afterwards said that the author of Crisol deserved to rank as a prose juvenile. Johnstone also wrote The Pilgrim, or A Picture of Life, and a picaresque novel, The History of John Juniper Esquire, alias Juniper Jack. Arthur Murphy, 1727 to 1805, born at Clunquin County, Roscommon, was educated at St. Omer. At first an actor, he afterwards studied law and was called to the English bar in 1762. He made a translation of Tacitus, and wrote several farces and comedies, among which may be mentioned The Apprentice, The Spouter, The Upholsterer, The Way to Keep Him, and All in the Wrong. He also wrote three tragedies, namely The Orphan of China, The Grecian Daughter, and Arminius. For the last named, which was produced in 1798, and which had a strongly political cast, he received a pension of two hundred pounds a year. His plays long held the stage. Oliver Goldsmith, 1728 to 1774, essayist, poet, novelist, playwright, historian, biographer, and editor, was a many-sided genius who, as Johnson said in his epitaph, left scarcely any kind of writing untouched, and touched none that he did not adorn. Born, probably, in County Longford, the son of a poor clergyman, he was educated at various country schools until, in 1744, he secured a sizership in Trinity College, Dublin. There he had a somewhat stormy career, but eventually took his degree in 1749. He then lounged at home for a while in his widowed mother's cottage at Ballymayan, until he was persuaded to take orders, but spoiled his already sufficiently poor chances of ordination by appearing before the Bishop of Elphin in scarlet breeches. After other adventures in search of a profession, he went to Edinburgh in 1752 to study medicine, and two years later transferred himself to Leyden for the same purpose. It was from Leyden that, with one guinea in his pocket— one shirt on his person, and a flute in his hand, he started on his celebrated walking tour of Europe, during which he gained those impressions which he afterwards was to embody in some of his greater works. In 1756 he arrived in England, where for three years he had very varied experiences. As a strolling player, an apothecary's journeyman, a practicing physician, a reader for the press, an usher in an academy, and a hack writer. In 1759 he published anonymously his Inquiry into the Present State of Polite Learning in Europe, which was well received and helped him to other literary work. The Bee, a volume of essays and verses, appeared in the same year. He was made editor of the Ladies' Magazine, he published Memoirs of Voltaire, 1761, A History of Mecklenburg, 1762, and A Life of Richard Nash, 1762. In 1762, also, he brought out his Citizen of the World, a collection of essays which takes an extremely high rank. In 1764, his poem, The Traveler, or A Prospect of Society, made its appearance, and in 1766, he gave to the world his famous novel, The Vicar of Wakefield. His reputation as a writer was now established. He was received into Johnson's circle and was made a member of the literary club. Reynolds and Burke were proud to call him a friend. In 1768, he had his comedy, The Good-Natured Man, produced at Covent Garden Theatre, where it achieved a fair measure of success and brought him in 400 pounds. In 1770, he repeated his triumph as a poet with The Deserted Village. He wrote a history of animated nature, a history of England, and a history of Rome, all compilations couched in that easy style of which he was master. He also wrote A Life of Parnell and A Life of Bolingbroke. Finally, in 1773, his great comedy, She Stoops to Conquer, was staged at Covent Garden and met with wonderful success. A little more than a year later, Goldsmith died of a nervous fever, the result of overwork and anxiety, and was buried in the burial ground of the Temple Church. His unfinished poem, Retaliation, a series of epigrams in epitaph form on some of his distinguished literary and artistic friends, was issued a few days after his death, and added greatly to his reputation as a wit and humorist, a reputation which was still further enhanced when, in 1776, the haunch of venison made its appearance. In the latter year a monument, with a medallion and Johnson's celebrated Latin epitaph attached, was erected to his memory in Westminster Abbey. Goldsmith's renown, great in his own day, has never since diminished. His essays, his novel, and his poems are still read with avidity and pleasure. His comedy is still acted. 
It is his statue that stands along with Burks at the entrance gate to Trinity College, Dublin, the alma mater seeking to commemorate in a striking manner two of her most distinguished sons by placing their effigies thus in the forefront of her possessions and in full view of all the world. Personally, Goldsmith was a very amiable and good-hearted man, dear to his own circle and dear to that Mr. Posterity to whom he once addressed a humorous dedication. He had his faults, it is true, but they are hidden amid his many perfections. Everyone will be disposed to agree with what Johnson wrote of him. Let not his frailties be remembered. He was a very great man. Edmund Burke, 1729 to 1797, born in Dublin, the son of a Protestant father and a Catholic mother whose name was Nagel, was educated first at a Quaker school in Ballator, County Kildare, and afterwards at Trinity College, Dublin. He became a law student in London, but he did not eventually adopt the law as a profession. He brought out in 1756 a Vindication of Natural Society, in which he so skillfully imitated the style and the paradoxical reasoning of Bolingbroke that many were deceived into the belief that Vindication was a posthumously published production of the Viscount's pen. In the following year, Burke published in his own name a philosophical inquiry into the origin of our ideas of the sublime and beautiful, which attracted widespread attention was translated into German and French, and brought its author into touch with all the leading literary men of London. He was instrumental with Dodsley, the publisher, in starting the annual register in 1759, and for close on thirty years he continued to supply it with the survey of events. He entered public life in 1760 by accompanying single-speech Hamilton to Dublin, when the latter was appointed chief secretary for Ireland. In 1765, he was made private secretary to the Prime Minister, the Marquis of Rockingham, and, as member for Wendover, entered Parliament, where he speedily made a name for himself. During Lord North's long tenure of office, 1770 to 1782, Burke was one of the minority and opposed the splendid force of his genius to the corruption, extravagance, and maladministration of the government. To this period belong, in addition to lesser works, his great speeches, on American Taxation, 1774, and On Conciliation with America, 1775, as well as his spirited letter to the Sheriffs of Bristol, 1777. He had been elected Member of Parliament for Bristol in 1774, but he lost his seat in 1780 because he had advocated the relaxation of the restrictions on the trade of Ireland with Great Britain and of the penal laws against Catholics. In the second administration of Rockingham, 1782, and in that of Portland, 1783, he was paymaster of the forces, a position which he lost on the downfall of the Whigs in the latter year, and he never again held public office. His speech on the impeachment of Warring Hastings in 1788 is universally and justly ranked as a masterpiece of eloquence. When the French Revolution broke out, he opposed it with might and main. His Reflections on the French Revolution, 1790, had an enormous circulation and reached an eleventh edition inside of a year, was read all over the continent as well as in the British Isles, and helped materially not only to keep England steady in the crisis, but also to incite the other powers to continue their resistance to French aggression. He continued his campaign in Thoughts on French Affairs and Letters on a Regicide Peace, he was given two pensions in 1794 and would have been raised to the peerage as Lord Beaconsfield, had not the succession to the title been cut off by the premature death of his only son. He himself died in 1797 and was buried at Beaconsfield, where, as far back as 1768, he had purchased a small estate. As an orator and a deep political thinker, Burke holds a foremost place among those of all time who distinguished themselves in the British Parliament. His keen intellect, his powerful imagination, his sympathy with the fallen, the downtrodden, and the oppressed, and his matchless power of utterance of the thoughts that were in him, have made an impression that can never be effaced. His wise and statesmanlike views on questions affecting the colonies ought to endear him to all Americans, although, if his counsels had been hearkened to, it is probable that the separation from the mother country would not have occurred as soon as it did. For his native land he used his best endeavors when and how he could, and although, as her defender, he was faced by obloquy, as well as by the loss of that parliamentary position which was as dear to him as the breath of his nostrils, he did not flinch or shrink from supporting her material and spiritual interests in his own generous, manly, whole-hearted way. Trinity College, Dublin, has done well in placing his statue at her outer gates as representing the greatest Irishman of his generation.
A political associate of Burke's for many years was Richard Brinsley Sheridan, 1751 to 1816, of County Cavan descent. Sheridan was born in Dublin and was educated partly in his native city and partly at Harrow, and the remainder of his life was spent in England. He was distinguished first as a playwright and afterwards as a parliamentary orator. In 1775, his comedy, The Rivals, was produced at Covent Garden Theatre, his farce, St. Patrick's Day, or The Scheming Lieutenant, and his comic opera, The Duenna, were staged in the same year. His greatest comedy, The School for Scandal, was acted at Drury Lane Theatre in 1777, and it was followed in 1779 by The Critic. His last dramatic composition was the tragedy Pizarro, produced in 1799. Elected to Parliament in 1780, Sheridan was made Under Secretary for Foreign Affairs in the Rockingham Administration of 1782, and in 1783 he was Secretary to the Treasury in the Coalition Ministry. He sprang into repute as a brilliant orator during the impeachment of Warren Hastings, 1787 to 1794. His speech on the Begums of Oud was one of the greatest ever delivered within the walls of the British Parliament. In 1806, on the return of the Whigs to power, he was appointed Treasurer in the Navy. In 1812, his long parliamentary career came to a close when he was defeated for the borough of Westminster. He died in 1816 and was honored with a magnificent funeral in Westminster Abbey. To give an idea as to how Sheridan's oratorical powers impressed his contemporaries, it is perhaps enough to repeat what Burke said of his second speech against Warren Hastings, namely, that it was the most astonishing effort of eloquence, argument, and wit united of which there is any record or tradition. And to add that, when, after three hours of impassioned pleading, he brought his first speech against Hastings to an end, the effect produced was so great that it was agreed to adjourn the House immediately and defer the final decision until the members should be in a less excited mood. As a dramatist, Sheridan is second in popularity to Shakespeare alone. The School for Scandal and The Rivals are as fresh and as eagerly welcomed today as they were a hundred and forty years ago. Like Burke, he was true to the land of his birth and his oppressed Catholic fellow countrymen. Almost his last words in the House of Commons were these, Be just to Ireland. I will never give my vote to any administration that opposes the question of Catholic emancipation. Sheridan belonged to a family that was exceptionally distinguished in English literature. Among those who preceded him as literateurs were his grandfather, the Reverend Thomas Sheridan, D.D., his father, Thomas Sheridan, and his mother, Frances Sheridan. Reverend Dr. Sheridan, 1684 to 1738, the friend and confidant of Dean Swift, kept a fashionable school in Dublin, edited the satires of Perseus in 1728, wrote a treatise on the art of punning, and figures largely in Swift's correspondence. Thomas Sheridan, 1721 to 1788, was at first an actor of considerable reputation, both in Dublin and in London, was next a teacher of elocution, and finally came forward with an improved system of education in which oratory was to have a conspicuous part. In this connection, he published an elaborate plan of education in 1769, but his ideas, some of which are in accord with modern practice, were not taken up. He also compiled a pronouncing dictionary of the English language with a prosodic grammar, and in 1784 published An Entertaining Life of Swift. Francis Sheridan, 1724 to 1766, wife of Thomas and mother of Richard Brinsley, who as Francis Chamberlain had been known as a poetess, wrote after her marriage two plays, The Discovery and The Droop, and two novels, The Memoirs of Miss Sidney Bidolph, which was a great success and was translated by the Abbe Prevost into French, and The History of Nour Jihad, an Oriental Tale. In 1775, the singular spectacle was presented of the son's play running at Covent Garden while the mother's was being acted at Drury Lane. Among Sheridan's descendants who earned a niche in the temple of literary fame were his granddaughters, the Countess of Dufferin, 1807-1867, and the Honorable Mrs. Norton, afterwards Lady Sterling Maxwell, 1808-1877, to 1877, and his great-grandson, the first Marquis of Dufferin and Ava, 1826-1902. to 1902. Lady Dufferin's Lament of the Irish Immigrant, I'm sitting on the style, Mary, has moved the hearts and brought tears to the eyes of countless thousands since it was published more than fifty years ago. Sir Philip Francis, 1740-1880, to 1880, born in Dublin, was the son of a clergyman of like name, 
who attained some literary eminence as a translator of Horace and as a political writer. After filling various important government positions, Philip Francis, the son, was in 1773 made a member of the Council of Bengal, where his relations with the Governor-General, Warren Hastings, were of an extremely strained character, amounting at times almost to a public scandal. He returned to England in 1781, entered Parliament, made a name as a speaker, took part in the impeachment of Hastings, and composed numerous political pamphlets. He is generally supposed to have been the writer of the celebrated Letters of Junius, which appeared at intervals in the public advertiser between January 21, 1769, and January 21, 1772. These letters are distinguished for their polished style, their power of invective, their galling sarcasm, their knowledge of state secrets, and their unparalleled boldness. Every prominent man connected with the government was attacked. Even the king himself was not spared. As revised by their pseudonymous writer in a reprint made in 1772, they number 70. A later edition, in 1812, contained 113 more. Their authorship has been the subject of much controversy, nor is the question yet finally settled. In his essay on Warren Hastings, written in 1841, Macaulay went to considerable trouble to prove, by the cumulative method, that Francis was the writer, and since then that opinion has been generally, but not universally, maintained. Isaac Bickerstaff, circa 1735 to circa 1812, was an Irishman whose name, strange to say, had no connection with the nom de guerre of the same style under which Swift had masqueraded in his outrageously satirical acts on Partridge the Almanac Maker, or with the more celebratory imaginary Isaac Bickerstaff, under cover of whose personality Steele conducted the tattler. The real Bickerstaff was a prolific playwright. His best-known pieces are The Sultan, The Maid of the Mill, Lionel and Carissa, and Love in a Village. In the last mention occurs the famous song beginning, We All Love a Pretty Girl Under the Rose. William Drennan, 1754-1820, who has been called the Tertius of the United Irishmen, was the son of a Presbyterian clergyman, was born in Belfast, and was educated at Glasgow and Edinburgh universities, taking a medical degree from the latter. He practiced his profession in the north of Ireland. When the Irish volunteers were established, Drennan entered heart and soul into the movement. Removing to Dublin in 1789, he associated with Tone and other revolutionary spirits, and became one of the founders of the Society of United Irishmen, the first statement of whose objects was the product of his pen. His letters of Oriana helped materially to enlist the men of Ulster in the ranks of the Society. He also wrote a series of stirring lyrics which, voicing as they did the general sentiment in Ireland at the time, became extremely popular and had a widespread effect. These were afterwards, 1815, collected under the title of Fugitive Pieces. All his political hopes being blasted with the failure of the rebellion of 1798 and of Emmett's insurrection in 1803, Drennan returned in 1807 to Belfast, and there founded the Belfast Magazine. The Wake of William Orr, a series of noble and affecting stanzas commemorating the judicial murder of a young Presbyterian Irish patriot in 1798, is one of his best-known pieces. He also celebrated the ill-fated brothers Shears. His song, Aaron, was considered by Moore to be one of the most perfect of modern songs. It was in this piece that he fixed upon Ireland the title of the Emerald Isle. When Aaron first rose from the dark swelling flood, God blessed the green island and saw it was good. The emerald of Europe, it sparkled and shone, in the ring of the world, the most precious stone. Mary Tiggy, 1772 to 1810, whose maiden name was Blashford, was born the daughter of a clergyman in County Wicklow. She contracted an unhappy marriage with her cousin, who represented Kilkenny in the Irish House of Commons. By all accounts, she was of great beauty and numerous accomplishments. She wrote many poems. Her best and best known is Psyche, or The Legend of Love, an adaptation of the story of Cupid and Psyche from the Golden Ass of Epileus. The meter she employed in this piece was the Spenserian stanza, which she handled with great power, freedom, and melody. Psyche, which first appeared in 1795, had a wonderful vogue, running rapidly through edition after edition. Among others to whom it appealed, and who were influenced by it, was Keats. Mrs. Tiggy's talent drew from Moore a delicate compliment in Tell Me the Witching Tale Again, and in The Grave of a Poetess, 
and I stood where the life of song lay low. Mrs. Hemans bewailed her untimely death. Edmund Malone, 1741 to 1813, the son of an Irish judge, was born in Dublin and studied at Trinity College. He was called to the Irish bar in 1767, but coming into a fortune, he abandoned his profession and gave himself over to literary work. In 1790, he brought out an edition of Shakespeare, which was deservedly praised for its learning and research. His critical acumen led him to doubt the genuineness of Chatterton's Rowley poems, and he was one of the first to expose Ireland's Shakespearean forgeries in 1796. Among other services to literature, he wrote A Life of Sir Joshua Reynolds and edited Dryden. He also left a quantity of materials afterwards utilized for the Variorum Shakespeare by James Boswell the Younger in 1821. John O'Keefe, 1747 to 1833, a Dublin man, was at first an art student, but soon became an actor, and then developed into a playwright. His pen was most prolific. He published a collection of over fifty pieces in 1798. His plays are mostly comic operas or farces, and some of them had great success. Lingo, the schoolmaster in The Agreeable Surprise, is a very amusing character. The Positive Man, The Son-in-Law, Wild Oats, Love in a Camp, and The Poor Soldier are among his compositions. His songs are well known, such as I Am a Friar of Orders Gray, and there are few schoolboys who have not sooner or later made the acquaintance of his Amo Amas I Loved Alas. For the last fifty-two years of his life, O'Keefe was blind, an affliction which he bore with unfailing cheerfulness. In 1826, he was given a pension of one hundred guineas a year from the King's Privy Purse. George Canning, 1770 to 1827, Prime Minister of England, properly belongs here, for although born in London, he was a member of an Irish family long settled at Garva and County Derry. Entering Parliament on the side of Pitt in 1796, he was made Secretary of the Navy in 1804, and in 1812 Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs. He became Prime Minister in 1827, but died within six months, leaving a record for scarcely surpassed eloquence. In addition to his speeches, he is known in literature for his contributions to the Anti-Jacobin, or Weekly Examiner, which ran its satirical and energetic career for eight months, November 1797 to July 1798. Some of the best things that appeared in this ultra-conservative organ were from Canning's pen. Few there are who have not laughed at his Loves of the Triangles, in which he caricatured Erasmus Darwin's Loves of the Plants, at the Needy Knife Grinder, or at the Song of Rogero in the Rovers, with its comic refrain of the University of Göttingen. Like most of the great Anglo-Irishmen of his time, Canning favored Catholic emancipation. It is interesting to note that it was a letter of Canning's that led to the formulation of the Monroe Doctrine. Henry Grattan, 1746 to 1820, the hero of Grattan's Parliament, was born in Dublin and studied at Trinity College. His history belongs to that of his country. Suffice it here to say that not only did he, by great eloquence and real statesmanship, secure a free Parliament for Ireland in 1782, but also that he fought energetically, if unavailingly, against the abolition of that Parliament in 1800, and that thenceforward he devoted his abilities to promoting the cause of Catholic emancipation. Dying in London, he was honored by being buried in Westminster Abbey. In an age of great orators, he stands out among the very foremost. His speeches have become classics and are constantly quoted. Another brilliant Irish orator, as well as an eminent wit of this period, was John Philpot Curran, 1750 to 1817, who, born at Newmarket County Cork and educated at Trinity College, Dublin, achieved a wonderful success at the Irish Bar. He defended with rare insight, eloquence, and patriotism those who were accused of complicity in the rebellion of 1798. As a member of Grattan's Parliament, he voiced the most liberal principles, and, though a Protestant himself, he worked hard in the Catholic cause. He held the great office of Master of the Rolls in Ireland from 1806 to 1814. The memory of few Irish orators, wits, or patriots is greener today than that of Curran. His daughter Sarah, whose fate is so inextricably blended with that of the ill-starred Robert Emmett, has been rendered immortal by Moore in his beautiful song, She is Far from the Land Where Her Young Hero Sleeps. Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin, 1759 to 1797, the first advocate of the rights of women, though born in London, was of Irish extraction. 
Into the details of her extraordinary and checkered career it is not possible or necessary here to enter. Her published works include Thoughts on the Education of Daughters, 1787, Answer to Burke's Reflections on the French Revolution, 1791, Vindication of the Rights of Women, 1792, and An Unfinished Historical and Moral View of the French Revolution, Volume 1, 1794. Having in August 1797 born to her husband, William Godwin, a daughter who afterwards became Shelley's second wife, Mary Godwin died in the following month. Whatever her faults, and they were perhaps not greater than her misfortunes, she had something of the divine touch of genius, and, in a different environment, might easily have left some great literary memento which the world would not willingly let die. Maria Edgeworth, 1767-1849, Though born at Blackborton in England, belonged to a family which had settled in different parts of Ireland, and finally at Edgeworthstown, County Longford, for nearly two hundred years. She was the daughter of Richard Lovell Edgeworth, 1744 to 1817, who was distinguished for his inventions, for his eccentricity, and for his varied matrimonial experiences, and who himself figures in literature as the author of memoirs, posthumously published in 1820, and as the partner with his daughter in Practical Education, 1798, and in an essay on Irish Bulls, 1802. Maria had a busy literary career and was before the public for 52 years, from 1795 to 1847. She wrote moral tales, popular tales, tales from fashionable life, and Harrington, but she is now best remembered for her three masterpieces dealing with Irish life and conditions, namely Castle Rackrent, 1800, The Absentee, 1812, and Ormond, 1817. By these works she inspired Scott, as he himself tells us, to attempt for his own country something of the same kind with that which she had so fortunately achieved for Ireland, and in a later day she inspired Turgenev to do similarly for Russia. She excels in wit and pathos, and gives a true and vivid presentation of the times and conditions as she viewed them. Andrew Cherry, 1763 to 1821, born in Limerick, became an actor, a theatrical manager, and a playwright. He wrote nine or ten plays, several of which were moderately successful. The one that is now remembered is The Soldier's Daughter. Some of his songs, such as The Bay of Biscay, Tom Moody the Whipper in, and especially the Green Little Shamrock of Ireland, bid fair to be immortal. Other Irish songwriters were Thomas Duffett, living 1676, author of Come All You Pale Lovers, Arthur Dawson, 1700 to 1775, author of Bumpers Squire Jones, George Ogle, 1742 to 1814, author of Molly Ashthor. Richard Alfred Milliken, 1767 to 1815, author of the grotesque Groves of Blarney. Edward Lycett, 1763 to 1811, author of Our Ireland, The Gallant Man Who Led the Van of the Irish Volunteers, and Kate of Garnavia. George Nugent Reynolds, 1770 to 1802, author of Kathleen O'More, Thomas Dermody, 1775 to 1802, author of the collection of poems and songs known as the Harp of Aaron. James Orr, 1770 to 1816, author of The Irishman. Henry Barreton Code, died 1830, author of The Sprig of Shillelagh. Charles Wolfe, 1791 to 1893, author of If I Had Thought Thou Couldst Have Died and of The Burial of Sir John Moore, and Charles Dawson Shanley, 1811 to 1875, author of Kitty of Colrain. Theobald Wolfe Tone, 1763 to 1798, born in Dublin, educated at Trinity College, and called to the Irish Bar in 1789, fills a large space in the history of his country from 1790 to his death in 1798. Intrepid, daring and resourceful. He was one of the most dangerous of the enemies to English domination in Ireland that arose at any time during the troubled relations between the two countries. Taken prisoner on board a French ship of the line bound for Ireland on a mission of freedom, he committed suicide in prison rather than submit to the ignominy of being hanged to which he had been condemned. 
he sleeps his last sleep in Bodenstown churchyard, in that county of Kildare to which he was connected by many ties. His grave is still the mecca of many a pilgrimage, and the cornerstone of a statue to his memory has been laid for some years on a commanding site in the city of his birth. He is known in literature for his journals and his autobiography, both containing sad but inspiring reading for the Irishmen of today. Here this rapid survey of Irish writers of English must close. To tell in any sort of appropriate detail the story of the English literature of Ireland in the 19th and 20th centuries would require a separate volume, a volume which is now under way and will, it is hoped, be speedily forthcoming. There is all the less need to attempt the agreeable task here, because in other portions of this book much more than passing reference is made to the chief Irish authors who, in the last hundred and fifteen years, have distinguished themselves and shed luster on their country. During that period, Irish poets, playwrights, novelists, essayists, historians, biographers, humorists, critics, and scholars have fully held their own, both in the quantity and the quality of the work produced, and have left an impression of power and personality, of graceful style and vivifying imagination, that in itself constitutes, and must forever constitute, one of the distinctive glories of Ireland. References Irish Literature, 10 Volumes, New York, 1904. Chambers's Cyclopedia of English Literature, 3 Volumes, Philadelphia and London, 1902-1904. Dictionary of National Biography, Encyclopedia Britannica. Cambridge History of English Literature. Dalton, History of Ireland, London, 1910. Lennox, Early Printing in Ireland, Washington, 1909. Addison and the Modern Essay, Washington, 1912. Lessons in English Literature, 21st Edition, Baltimore, 1913. Macaulay, Essays, History of England. Brown, A Reader's Guide to Irish Fiction, London, 1910. A Guide to Books on Ireland, Dublin, 1912. End of Section 38 End of the Glories of Ireland Edited by Joseph Dunn and P.J. Lennox.